Are we ready? Okay, great. Welcome everyone to another in-person meeting of the Housing and Homelessness Committee. Today is Wednesday, May 17th. We actually have two meetings today, one regular and a special. Um, and because of, uh, there's overlap between an item on the regular agenda and the special agenda, so we're gonna run this meeting um, so that we hear public comment for both the regular meeting and the special meeting back to back. We'll hear agenda item one on the special meeting and then we'll adjourn that and go back to the regular meeting for the rest of the items. Uh, so I think that's it. Today I have, I thought I saw Council Member Blumenfield here, but I think he is here. Council Member Harris Dawson and Council Member Rodriguez. Mr. Verano, could you please call the roll? Council Member Rahman. Here. Council Member Blumenfield. Council Member Harris Dawson. Council Member Rodriguez. Here. Council Member Lee. Four members and a quorum, Madam Chair. Okay. Great. Um, and I just want to go through quickly the items. Thank you, Mr. Blumenfield. Uh, before we get into public comment for the regular agenda, item one is a communication from the mayor's office about Robert Ramirez withdrawing himself from consideration for appointment to the Rent Adjustment Commission. Item two is a report about reprogramming unexpended funds from Prop HHH, from the Prop HHH facilities program. Item three is um, a report about amending the Prop HHH 2021 project expenditure plan, or the PEP, um, and removing the Hackla owned Home Key 2 project in CD2 from the PEP. Item four is a report about Prop HHH activities and projects for the second quarter of fiscal year 22-23. Item five is a 17th roadmap report from the CAO. Item six are both reports from the CAO uh, and uh, BOE about HAP3 funding. Item seven is a motion talking about how the process through which the city removes rental units from the REAP program and uh, asking for maybe some changes on how council offices are notified about these REAP removals. Item eight is a motion related to um, cooling apparatus uh, and requiring them in residential units and potential programs to assist low-income and middle-income tenants with subsidies. Um, this is just a motion uh, with uh, a request for a report. Item nine is two reports from HACLA regarding expediting leasing for EHV program participants. They updated their report, and so there's actually two in there. Um, item 10 is a CAO report about the homelessness emergency account fund status, which is the funding source for Inside Safe. Um, the item 10 has uh, the report for the week ending March 31st, and the special agenda contains a report for a later date. And so we have an update on that report. So that's why we're hearing that first. Um, and before we begin public comment, uh, I think CAO has two amendments, one for item five and one for item six, so I welcome the CAO to read those amendments into the record at this time. Would you like to read the item, the amendment for item five? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Annabelle Gonzalez with the CAO's office. Um, so our office would like to amend um, the CAO report relative to the 17th roadmap COVID-19 homelessness roadmap funding recommendations dated May 12th, 2023. Council file 20-0841-S34 be amended to add the following recommendations. 18J, reflect the funding and expenditure authority for 499 San Fernando. Recommendation 24, approve $3,396,405 from HAP3. Fund number 65S, department 10, account number 10W744. Funding category four, outreach, hygiene, prevention, and support services to fund number 65S, department 43, account number 43WC34. 2022-23 roadmap outreach teams to support the COVID-19 homelessness roadmap outreach services from July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2024. 
and recommendation 25 to instruct the general manager of LAHD or their designee to amend the half contract number 135650 with LASA to reflect the allocation shown in recommendation 24 in this report. In recommendation 26 to approve $158,048 from Additional Homeless Services General City Purposes Fund number 100, Department 56, account number 000931 to the Office of the City Administrative Officer Fund number 100, Department 10, account number 00340, Contractual Services for the continuation of multidisciplinary teams, MDTs in Council Districts 2 and 3 and 26A to instruct the CAO or their designee to amend the contract with the LA County Department's uh, Health Services contract number 139823 to reflect the funding in the above recommendation and to amend recommendation 8 to read as follows authorize the extension of the expenditure authority for 990,000 from Homeless Efforts County Funding Agreement Fund number 63Q, Department 43, account number 43WC29, 2022-23, other interim housing operations for operations at the Northeast New Beginnings Community located at 499 San Fernando Road in Council District 1 through June 30, 2024, and recommendation 8A to request LASA to execute a new sole source contract or amend its current contract with the John Wesley Center for Health in the up to amount of 999,000, excuse me, 990,000 for operating costs to operate an interim housing site located at 499 San Fernando Road in Council District 1 through June 30, 2024. And to amend recommendation 12 to read as follows, approve up to $2,162,160 of Homeless Efforts County Funding Agreement Funds, fund number 63Q, 63Q Department 10, account number 10T618, Homeless Effort County Agreement Funding to Fund Number 63Q, Department 43, in the newly established account entitled 2023-24 Tiny Home Village Operations for the Tiny Home Village located at 850 Mission in Council District 14 for 144 beds. And lastly, to amend Recommendation 22F to read as follows, approve up to $790,240.25 from 2023-24 Additional Homeless Services General City Purposes Fund 100, Department 56, account number 000931 to the CAO fund number 100, Department 10, account number 003040 Contractual Services for the continuation of multidisciplinary teams in Council Districts 2 and 3 and to instruct the CAO or their designee to amend the contract with the Los Angeles County's Department of Health Services, contract 139823, to reflect the funding in the above recommendation. <laughs> Thank you. Take a deep breath. Um, and then I'm gonna accept that amendment and we're gonna vote on this item later as amended. Uh, and let, can you read the item for amendments? Sorry, the item, amendment for item six, please. Good afternoon, my name is Mindy Potongsonen with the Office of the CAO. Uh, so we would like to add the following recommendation to the HAP3 report, which is 20, for Council File 20-1524-S1. I'd like to reprogram $3,396,405 from the Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Round 3 HAP 3 fund number 65S, department 10, account number 10W741, FC-1 interim housing operations and capital costs to HAP 3 fund number 65S, department 10, account number 10W744, FC-4 outreach, hygiene prevention and supportive services. Okay, great. Thank you both for those reading those amendments into the record so I didn't have to. Uh, right now, let's move to public comment. Uh, and I just want to make sure we do have an interpreter available if needed. That's correct, Madam Chair. Thank you. So we have uh, Todd Leung here from the City Attorney's Office who's going to provide some guidance to the public as they give comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. To members of the public who would like to provide public comment, when it is your turn to speak, please state your name and which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more items. In addition, 
those who would like to address the committee with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum up to three minutes per person for all agenda items, including general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, please be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you're speaking on an agenda item, I will give you one brief warning. If you continue to be off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time and we will move on to the next speaker. Okay, great. And Mr. Leung, I think we'll be very vigilant in making sure that our public commenters are staying on topic. So thank you for your vigilance. Uh, let me call a few um, public commenters. Richard Corral, Raul Claros, and Peter Park. If you guys are here, just make your way to the podium. Could you please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on? Or Richard item? Corral, general uh, comment, please. Great, you Public have one comment. minute. My name is Richard Corral. I'm CEO and Principal Consultant of Corral Consulting. I'm also the co-chair of the Affordable Housing and Homelessness Solutions Working Group, comprised of 100% affordable housing investors, developers, small property owners, general contractors, modular construction factory operators, real estate agents, nonprofit homeless service providers, as well as advocates. I share my support for Council Member Bob Blumenfeld's motion that requested LAHD to create a pilot program to house formerly homeless Angelinos and ADUs. That report has been submitted to council, and I'd like for this committee to agendize discussion on that report at the next committee meeting. I support the LAHD's report recommendation to allocate $175,000 from SB2 funding to release an RFP that secures a partner to manage an ADU pilot program. I also support usage of city funds to construct and subsidize ADU construction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Raul Claros, Peter Park, and Peggy Lee Kennedy. What items would you like to speak on? And your name, please. Uh, I'd like to speak about housing and homeless the situation. So, so that's, I, I think it's probably general public comment. You have one minute, sir. Thank you. So my name is Peter Park. I'm the uh, chairman for Dreams Come True Foundation. We are dedicated in providing uh, affordable housing, low income, senior housing, and so on. Uh, and I'm a, also a member of the Affordable Housing and Homelessness Solutions Working Group, uh, comprised of uh, a lot of uh, different uh, investors, developers, property owners, uh, real estate professionals. I share my support for council member, Bob Blumenfields, Motion that requested LAHD to create a pilot program to house formerly homeless Angelinos in ADUs. Uh, I'm also here to support LAHD's report recommendation to allocate 175,000 from SB2 funding to release an RFP that secures a partner to manage an ADU pilot program. My time ran out, ran out I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speakers, Raul Claros, Peggy Lee Kennedy, and Max Sherman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Raul Claros uh, just uh, joined this work group that just presented before I did uh, earlier today here at City Council, uh, asking for the full support of Mayor Bass's budget that I believe meets the moment and the urgency uh, that is this humanitarian crisis when it comes to the lack of affordability across the city of Los Angeles. Um, as well as the, ho the humanitarian crisis that is just homelessness, period. Um, we've also uh, had the opportunity to participate in the commission that I was just voted as the new chair of the Affordable Housing Commission. So I'm here to just introduce myself to this committee. I look forward to working with the chair and the members of, of this committee and supporting the LA Housing Department, Mayor Bass, uh, from a grassroots, grass top perspective because we've all learned uh, from the past that none of us can do it on our own. 
And so this is gonna definitely take an inside, outside, outside, inside approach um, that we're uh, ready to work uh, hand in hand, locked arms in arms uh, through the leadership of our mayor and this committee. Thank you. Congratulations on your appointment, thank you. Next speaker, Peggy Lee Kennedy, Max Sherman, and hurry up. Hi, Peggy Lee Kennedy, I, uh, seven, nine, 10, and general public. So you have two minutes for the items and one minute for general public comment, I believe. I think it's great that you're looking at this REAP program because I feel like it inappropriately targets people on the lower income side. And uh, I would also recommend that you look at the big violators, like in Venice, there's this one apartment building, 60 apartments. And that's how it's paying its property taxes and it's and a motel. I mean, I think they've gotten rich enough so that you could say they're a code violator and put them in violation and go after them. Mm -hmm. uh, nine, uh, I, I mean, I'm happy that the, there's more vouchers being used. It's great. But the fact is, is I think that this uh, council uh, is overlooking the fact that all you're really doing is creating this uh, poverty industry with all of this funding, and this sort of bleeds into 10. But the fact is, is that uh, we have uh, missed so many opportunities to purchase property and turn it into public housing because we need affordable public housing. I mean, Prop 63, we hardly used any of that for the matching to buy uh, buildings for people living with mental health issues. And now look at where we are. We think that uh, we can 5150 them out of public view and that's some kind of a solution uh, when we've totally uh, screwed them over. And um, you know, general, I'm just gonna say general public comment. Where are your unhoused advisors, really? Where are they? Because you know, you want to sit up here and make all these decisions, the entire council sitting up here making decisions. I really had a hard time even getting here because I'm older and I'm now disabled. So, what, you know, I don't want people making decisions for me and uh, my ability. So why are you making decisions for all these people that are homeless without real counsel from that population? And another thing is, we've got these oversized vehicle ordinance going straight through transportation. And really, that law is to criminalize people living in RVs. Where is that, and when is that ever coming in front of this committee? You know, I was listening to Ms. Marquez, and I, you know, God bless her, about, oh, we got a contract for safe parking at the airport, a parking lot with no shade, with the worst air quality in the city of LA. And that's what you think of people Thank who live in Thank you, Ms. Kennedy, and I appreciate your comments. Max Sherman, hurry up, and Dontavia Porter. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Thank you for the Could time. Could you tell us your name and the items oh, you want sure. to talk on? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm speaking on agenda item eight and general public comment. So you have one minute for the item, one minute for general public comment. Thank you. My name is Max Sherman. I'm speaking on behalf of the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles. We implore the committee to request the report look at the immense cost and unintended harmful impact that would come with requiring small property owners to uh, have cooling apparatus in all residential units. The cost for installing these units can be significant and would likely cause some housing providers to have to sell their properties as they would not be able to afford fulfilling these requirements and would only, this would only further displace renters. Additionally, the motion mentions exploration of potential programs to assist renters with subsidies to offset related costs, but there is no mention, mention of a subsidy program or subsidies for small rental housing providers that will have to install these units. This is needed so all impacted parties are receiving support. We urge the committee to instead look at expanding existing initiatives such as uh, expanding access to cooling centers with free transit for renters, as well as requiring this in ground up new construction built as an alternative. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate those comments and we can certainly make the report more comprehensive. 
Uh, hurry up, Dontavia Porter and Alexander Kim, please. Could you please state your name and the items you wish to speak on? Yeah, my name is Dontavia Porter and I'm speaking on Agenda 9. Agenda item and 9. And public comments. So you have one minute for the item, one minute for your public comment. Okay. Um, I understand about the EHV, but also, like, I was one of the tenants that was supposed to receive one of those. Mm -hmm. I have my confirmation and everything, okay. but it's almost been a year. I haven't received it. Lassa told me to go to an organization that will dispute it. I never got it disputed, and I've been having problems ever since. It went from they were going to dispute it to they sending me to PATH to dispute it, and I never got an email back from LASA whatsoever. And also, they wanted all my, my documents, and so I'm just trying to figure out why did they want my social, everything, but yet I was not issued those vouchers. And it's been other families that haven't received those vouchers either. So where are those vouchers going to? Mm -hmm. That's a big concern. And the public comment is for LASA and PATH. Um, LASA sent me to PATH, and PATH was supposed to dispute it. I never got anything disputed. They're hiding my files. Um, I had incidents where they took belongings and never brung those items back. Um, I was terminated. I felt like I was terminated illegally because my daughter has asthma. And now we're currently homeless because I chose to be in the street versus be somewhere my daughter's gonna keep having these attacks, basically. And so I, I just feel like that's very unfair to, and unfortunate to these children that we have to sit here and do all these things when it is their job. Okay, thank you for your comment. I'm gonna have a member of my staff talk to you over there and get your information so we can follow up on your question, okay? Next speaker, please, Alexander Kim, Terrell Brown, and Sarah E. Alexander Kim, public comment. Great, you have one minute, sir. My name is Alexander Kim, and I'm a board member of Dreams Come True Foundation, a nonprofit organization for affordable housing. I'm also the CEO of Home First Mortgage Bankers, and I'm a member of the Affordable Housing and Homelessness Solutions Working Group. I also share my support for Council Member Bob Blumenfield's motion that requested LAHD to create a pilot program to house formerly homeless Angelinos and ADUs. That report has been submitted to Council, and I'd like for this committee to ag agendize discussion on that report at the next committee meeting. I support the LAHD's report recommendation to allocate 175,000 from SB2 funding to release an RFP that secures a partner to manage an ADU pilot program. I also support using general funds and eventually ULA funds to subsidize ADU construction to house low acuity individuals and families that are at risk of homelessness, have recently experienced homelessness, or are ready to transition from interim housing to support the implementation of the LAHD ADU rec report recommendations. Thank you. We appreciate your comment. Uh, Terrell hello. Brown, Michelle Torin, and Sarah E. Go ahead. Uh, What's your name and the items you'd like to speak on? My name is Terrell Brown, and I want to speak on general N9. Okay, so you have one minute for the item and one minute for general public comment. Okay, so um, I was recently homeless and I was staying at a program called Safe Place for Youth in Venice. Uh, while I was there, I applied for an EHV voucher and it took about a year and a half to hear anything back from them. When I finally heard any, uh, anything back from them, I got my voucher and they were supposed to do an inspection. Mm -hmm. They did it, it didn't pass, and they had another one for the next month. It passed, but we didn't know until the property management reached out to them. Mm -hmm. um, after that, it still took them months to even do the first deposit or anything. Had to go through another program so I could even move in. Um, 
my caseworker constantly changed and I was never notified about it and they were never kept to date. And uh, I just wanted to speak and give a point that there should be more oversight over HACLA and what they're doing over there. Seems like they really don't care. Well, thank you for that feedback. That's why we're ha hearing this item today. Um, and I, if you want, my staff member is right there. If you want to talk about your case, we can follow up with you about it. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Yes, my name is Sarah, and I'm speaking on general comment and number nine. You have uh, one minute for the item, one minute for general comment. Perfect. Um, I would like to speak to you as a case manager for a nonprofit organization, Safe Place for Youth, supporting homelessness and youth obtaining permanent housing. I've come into many issues with our EHV program in place, issue, issues such as lack of communication with HACLA case managers and the listed person of contact, which delays the housing process. I've had experience where an assigned HACLA case manager doesn't notify the POC case manager when a client receives a voucher and also fails to notify a case manager and client when there's a switch in case management at HACLA. Mm -hmm. Another big issue is the inconsistency with the uh, extension process while clients have serious issues that arise and cannot find housing in time. Many HACLA case managers have told me they accept extensions while some tell me they're not available. This is why I'm also advocating for higher oversight to be put in place so members don't lose out on their voucher and revert back to homelessness. I also want to push expediting the EHV process which gives less time for communication to lapse or also a change of case managers to happen so often. Thank you. Thank you, that's really helpful. And if we could get your contact information, uh, Heidi? Yes. From her as well. We'll, uh, we'll make sure and follow up. Okay, next speaker, please. Um, Michelle Torin, Catherine McNenny, and Fred Sutton. That would be me. Because for some reason, Critical Truth Bay was not called, so I signed the Michelle it's Torin. It's just a little later on the list, that's all. It's okay. Yeah, sorry. That, yeah. Not a problem. I just signed Michelle Torrin five seconds ago. But uh, that's agenda number, yeah, all agenda items and public comment. So you have two minutes for the agenda items, one minute for general public comment. So I, I believe there's some type of progress that happened this morning, uh, difference. The main thing is the two agencies that you have. Well, the main agency, uh, LASA, um, I believe Mr. Vood, uh, Nathaniel just arrived here as well. He can probably explain to us why certain black homeless service providers have not received capacity building. HMIS access, it cannot just be LASA and the same repeat offenders. You have to have city council and Sodom County Council have access to that. But you have one agency since 1994 that has misappropriated countless of dollars. You have the Hilton Hotel that they built within a year. Same Hilton that's giving money hand over foot to LASA, again, for staff. So the EHV, that was another fiasco. You had 100 families in South LA, District 8 again, that was dropped the ball. A lot of their EHV that was on the list, they were probably number 1 through 12, and then they were removed from the list altogether. These things must stop. Mm -hmm. Again, there are lived experience people who know how to house the homeless, if you don't know how to house them, it's okay to work with your constituents that voted you in. So Mr. Bloomingfield is the only noble in Ms. Rahman, but Ms. Bloomingfield went far and beyond to try to house people in his district when the resources that you guys voted for, Dulasa is not even helping you. So I wanna commend you, Mr. Bloomingfield, Please don't talk to that rat face. I'm giving you a compliment right now, and let's not continue on the wrong path. Because there are still a lot of seniors that are out there, families that don't have housing, and District 8 and Adeen Banyam don't know how to house in that district. Okay? So stay in your lane. Continue to be the leadership in your, in your uh, um, district to help those families. That's it? Public comment? Yeah, so I have minute. one more minute. It's okay, I'm wrapping it up. Um, overall, on one a... One more minute. One more minute. Okay, go ahead. Okay, on minute. a national Sorry. level, we are going to work on homelessness on a national level. Gavin Newsom had a homeless czar position that was removed, and that's going to be replaced. The only thing that we want, we don't want to keep coming here with families. We don't want to keep seeing disrespectful city councilmen who have many mansions to go to. These families want to stop sleeping in their cars. So when we say that we have a solution for you, District 7, 
You can say, no, 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 we don't need help. I don't need help, check my track record. That's not an answer that you give your constituents. As a body, you failed as homelessness. It's okay to make that mistake and do the right thing. But don't be arrogant about it and then continue to have these families sleep in their cars. And then you still have Lhasa or somebody passing the torch, or we'll call you back in three days. That's unacceptable. There's enough money and understanding to let's work together. Appreciate you. Thank you. Catherine McNenny, Fred Sutton, and Dexter O'Connell. Uh, my name is Catherine McNenny. I want to speak on uh, public comment and agenda item eight. Agenda item eight. You yep. have one minute for the item, one minute for general public comment. Okay, public comment first. Um, this is in reference to Council File 23-00321, Emergency Funding for the Skid Row Housing Trust Portfolio. Will there be any sort of resident advisory council for the tenants of the Skid Row Housing Trust buildings? There have long been complaints by these tenants that those who tried to organize for better conditions faced retaliation, threats, and eviction from management. These complaints have been lodged for years against the trust and shared with elected and appointed officials with no restorative or correction act, corrective action until the house of cards totally collapsed. Now, of course, you all are forced to act. Part of what made the trust so dysfunctional was that the tenants' voices were silenced repeatedly. There has been no apology to the tenants by the city. Maybe start there. Public housing, on the other hand, managed by the city's housing authority, provides for resident advisory councils. The city of Los Angeles should mandate that these same be implemented for these tenants. Have any of you reached out to the tenants to get their perspective or testimony, invited them to participate in making these properties healthier? Have any of you visited these properties? Again, the tenants' voices is missing from your work here, and I would encourage you to reach out to them. They have many questions, by the way. There have been no community meetings to discuss what's going on with their homes. In reference to agenda item eight, relative to requiring cooling apparatus in all re rental units, again, many Skid Row Housing Trust, but also SRO Housing Corporation tenants have suffered for years during the sweltering downtown summers with no AC. Even the newer buildings report many broken cooling systems, systems that don't turn on, or controls they don't have access to. What can your committee do to make sure they ha all have access to AC? What will your outreach look like? Please consider that the digital divide is real and that many low-income tenants lack internet access. Your outreach must be door-to-door, face-to-face, and community appropriate. I am very glad to see attention paid to cooling systems for low-income people in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Fred Sutton, Stephanie Taylor, and Dexter O'Connell. Uh, Fred Sutton speaking on item eight in general public comment. You have one minute and one minute. Thank you, council members. We appreciate all you do. Um, our members help house Los Angeles. We respectfully request the committee include a more robust report back to inform the council on item number eight. It should include, but not be limited to, reviewing costs associated with the type of work and the ramifications of a potential code amendment. Mm -hmm. It's slightly vague what a, a cooling apparatus is referring to, but assuming it's referring to air conditioning, there are different types that have their own different com uh, complications. As these units were rented without cooling systems, the building may not have been designed for them. So one example, there could be a building load, there could be building load issues which trigger substantial upgrades, and there could be other systems that need to be upgraded um, uh, with higher load capacity. We also respectfully request inclusion in stakeholder feedback sessions so housing providers uh, can weigh in on the nuances of these policy issues as you review them. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate those comments. Uh, Stephanie Taylor, Dexter O'Connell, and Darren Hendon. Hi, Dexter O'Connell on general public comment and item number nine, please. You have one minute and one minute. Thank you. Hello, members of council. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, HACLA's deliberate inaction and reactive action are the root cause of ongoing homelessness, particularly amongst the document-ready members of Safe Place for Youth on the west side of Los Angeles. Uh, HACLA's systems are antique and they are opaque, uh, making it impossible to get real current information to our case managers who are desperately trying to house our members. These systems obfuscate who the responsible parties at HACLA are that our case managers should be communicating with, and 
the real-time information about where our members' vouchers are in the processing uh, system does not exist. Hackla's lack of transparency and honesty about these shortcomings make these issues that much more frustrating. Their refusal to come to the table to communicate meaningfully about individual cases or the issues in general is glaring and problematic and demands additional oversight from the council. The report which you have in front of you is not as much of a whitewash as the previous version of the report, but you will find it is still a whitewash of their failures in the EHV system which have kept our members homeless and in one case amounted to a constructive eviction when our member had a voucher that was on the edge of expiring, the landlord missed one situation of a meeting, and Hakla refused to extend the voucher even though the landlord had agreed to lease the unit to the tenant, um, and the tenant had the voucher in hand. Um, it is very obvious that Hakla needs this committee to take a more active oversight role uh, you are the folks who vet their board members. You are the folks who can make them pay attention and make them put in some degree of effort to house Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. That is why these items appear on the agenda consistently, but thank you for your comment. Uh, next, let's have Stephanie Taylor, uh, Darren Hendon, and D.A. Good afternoon. I am Stephanie Taylor and 910 and a general comment. Two minutes uh, and one minute. Perfect. Um, about the EV, about the vou vouchers, we had a situation within our own organization when it came to those. We would just like the city to know that we would like for the vouchers for these um, homeless veterans that have already been vetted in our resources to fast track those mm -hmm. and reissue any of the bash vouchers that were not um, given in 2019 and 2020. We, t we still have a homeless population that is just sitting still and we're waiting for either the emergency vouchers or the VASH vouchers. So we would like for the city to work with us and HACLA so we could at the very least house the homeless veterans because the vouchers are there. Um, and I can just move on to the emergency um, no, item number 10 if you Please. guys would like because yes. that was just a simple port. Sure. The emergency, state of emergency. Now, Yesterday, we discussed hotels with amongst um, the committee, and the city has 25. I do believe that was the number. We're a small organization. We have nine. We have nine hotels. We have a few in a, a couple of districts, and we, I'm not going to itemize which ones because I sent out emails to them. Um, the money, as the only state-certified nonprofit veteran agency, um, we don't have to necessarily go through the city, but if the city would stop asking for money for the homeless veterans, we can go directly to the state and request that fund. But we would prefer for the only and first NVSA to work within the city. If you want to know where the money is, we can all work together so you can see where the money was going, because that was the question yesterday. Where is the money going? I know the money was going into the streets, not to the people that we serve, the homeless population. There could be full disclosure. There could be an awesome art, uh, conversation about funding. We want to be that organization to give you the answers to that and work together for the veteran population. Into my general comment, the veteran population who is entitled. They're entitled because they did something so we can argue about how we're going to fund them, right? They were in the military at first. And so we want to make sure, without having to go through lobbyists, without having to have lunch with people, we just want to house and provide proper social services to our men, women, and their children. That's all we want to do. It is not a simple solution, but at the very least, I am here to talk about the veterans and the veteran only. So if the city would like to have this conversation, we would love to show you what it is that we are doing. We would love to discuss the nine hotels plus that are open to us. We would love to have that conversation. And I've been here like six times hoping that someone would be interested. Thank you. So my, my staff member is going to get your contact info. She, she's over there. OK. Uh, next speaker, please. We have, uh, did we hear from Darren Hendon? 
Go ahead, and yes. Uh, nine, ten, and general comments. You have two minutes and one minute. Thank you. Um, what better place to um, share this information regarding um, the EHV vouchers? Um, we have been operating, first of all, my name is Darren Hendon. I'm the executive director and founder uh, and home, former homeless veteran of Veteran Social Services. We operate a 16 unit um, uh, interim housing for veterans right down the street. And fortunately, we were able to house two veterans with the EHV vouchers. They've moved in, we've provided services, uh, follow up with them every month to make sure that they're okay. Um, then they cut the program off. And we have a very sensitive population of veterans that are formerly incarcerated. And I don't know if it is an action from city council, um, but the veterans that are housed at our facility could utilize the EHV voucher. They're a very sensitive population, mm -hmm. formerly incarcerated. Um, one of the formerly incarcerators just got accepted for his master's degree. So it doesn't matter where you've been, it's just about where you're going. And we're an agency that's helping veterans recreate their lives. Um, item 10 regarding the uh, emergency funds. Um, as uh, my chief operations officer, Stephanie Taylor, had mentioned about the nine hotels that we have. Um, Mr. Marquise Dawson, Harris Dawson, we have four hotels in your district. Um, we've set up meetings with Maurice, your deputy, um, and that has kind of gotten nowhere. So I really would like to definitely speak to you um, through Maurice or through you personally about um, providing interim housing in District 8. We have the hotel owners on board. Um, none of the funded organizations that receive the emergency funds have reached out to these hotel owners and we have we have agreements with them and we will be providing the supportive services um, and um, that's just the breakdown of what what's happening um, is the supportive services following up with providing um, the homeless population with uh, with permanent housing so I, I implore you to look at us as an agency that wants to be a part of the solution and not the problem. And we are a veteran service agency. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll have DA, um, somebody with the initials GND, and Betty uh, Teodovic. Uh, yes, my name is DA. I'd like to speak um, under the general public comment uh, section as well as uh, item four and item 10. I'll, so I'll touch on those. But two minutes for the items, one minute for general public comment. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'd like to speak on private sector involvement in the housing movement. Um, the taxing uh, bureaucracy is inefficient. And uh, although uh, HHP uh, funds as well as uh, the emerg emergency allotment funds are very vital, and they're good starters for fixing the homelessness crisis in LA. Uh, private sector involvement is required um, to make it really work on a sustainable level. And for the business community, bringing in, in companies uh, is in their best interests. Um, from a marketing perspective, um, making sure that the LA culture is conducive to doing business in terms of getting uh, national investment and international investment in these companies requires that we clear out these encampments just on a basic um, business interest level. Um, and in terms of, of our dysfunctional economy, which, which is creating this uh, homelessness crisis, um, investing uh, in affordable housing um, is a more sustainable um, solution econ economically than just investing in market rate housing, because there's more people who need affordable housing than who need uh, market rate housing. Um, and also in terms of, of our economy um, and businesses, um, there is an, an ongoing labor shortage across the country. Um, and home, there are many homeless people who I've met who are really eager to work. Uh, an attempt jobs program, uh, ideally coming from the business community, would, would help that a great deal. 
Um, additionally, um, the uh, extended uses of, of um, extending the usage of, of ADUs, both at con construction sites and, and other uh, business locations, such as small businesses, automotive garages, and the like, would help the crisis as well. In addition, private citizens can become involved by um, having ADUs for family members and the like. Um, if we could, um, you know, bring in um, more of a private sector interest into the homelessness crisis, into the homeless, into the housing movement, as I as I like to call it, um, through public service ads and um, ombudspersons uh, programs. Um, and just in general creating greater community liaisons through active citizens and uh, neighborhood associations and the like. Like Gloria Molina, let us all pave the way for new voices to speak in this new political movement, which I call the housing movement. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Our last two speakers, with one with the initial GND and Donald Harlan. Yes, three minutes. So what's GND stand for? What? Okay. So what, are you speaking on why is, why what's wrong? The little schoolgirl can't see the court? Goat nigger developer? Stay on, stay on topic. Well, we're little children, so we'll talk like babies. So let's talk about thank you, Blob. Um number eight. What the hell is Cooling apparati. You know, see, I go to school, and isn't Nithya a graduate of MIT? You should know there's no goddamn fucking word as apparati. That's not the name we call it. Apparati? What is this? Are we speaking in aspirinto? What the fuck is this? Requiring cooling apparatus. What the hell is that? You can't call a speaker card and you can't even spell and you're running the second largest city in the United States of America? And why are you forcing people to spend money after not being paid their rent for three fucking years to spend money on these Air conditioning apparatus. Do you know how Would much it costs to, to install item? this fucking shit? Do you know how much per unit that costs? That stuff has to be code. Yeah. You have to have 220. You can't yeah. just plug that thing in. You got to have 220. You got to have fuses. You got to meet code. You got to have the building inspector write off on the permits before you can even turn that apparatus on. Now, who the fuck is going to pay for that? Why? These landlords haven't been paid for three years, and you're going to put this shit on their backs? You people with your apparatus, go stick that you know the fuck where, right? Now, we'll get one minute of general. I've been sitting here like a dog, Bob. Friday, not ever fucking called to a meeting. Tuesday, on the phone for three hours, not called. You guys do that shit on purpose. You fucking do that on purpose. Then you throw somebody out of the meeting and you call them me. You're saying it's me saying something. You guys do everything you can to stop me from standing here and speaking. Why? What are you afraid of? Could it be FBI? Could that be what you're afraid of? Speaker, I don't know. you need to stay on topic. Is that the fuck? How the fuck could it not be on the topic? How could the FBI not be on the topic? You have three council members convicted. How can the FBI, and they've sat on this committee, not be on the fucking agenda, right? You tell me. So do me a favor. Put Kevin DeLeon back in charge of this thing and so uh, we can get this shit done. Thank you. Next speaker. We have Betty Teodovic and Donald Harlan as our final speakers. What items would you like to speak on? Domestic violence. Sorry? Domestic violence. So that's general public comment. You have one minute. Yes, yes. But first, I want to do this. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you that you bring your peace, your shalom in this place, and everybody is calm, and everybody, Lord, is 
doing, what we have to do, and what you have called us to do. Father, for your glory, America is being blessed, and let God bless America again and again. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm very concerned I'm a domestic violence victim myself. I speak a few languages, and I have seen myself very, very sick in the hospital because I cannot work until I get my housing process project approved. It's been a while, and I think Hapix. I really think Hapix for it because I'm in a place right now waiting for my processing and apartment housing, but it's been very, very hard. Why? Because the budget supposedly is not there. So it needs more budget for domestic violence. Please. Thank, thank you. We appreciate your comment. Thank, thank you. Next speaker, last speaker, Donald Harlan. And if you could stay on topic, Mr. Harlan. Okay, uh, this is about the homeless program. Uh, I would so like to speak on agenda so you, items number you three. You have one minute, one minute. Three, for, six, nine, and general comment. Okay, two minutes for the items, one minute for general public comment. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number four, the Triple H funding. Uh, I'll challenge that, I'd say it's fake. Uh, that's sponsored by LAPD and Hilton Hotels. It's an attempt to develop illegally develop real estate affordable apartments. They said it was going to cost 132000 for an apartment, and now they're $834,000 for an affordable apartment. Uh, and uh, I would challenge that. You see, there's a problem that uh, people in the media make up fake cases, especially LAPD. They're desperate for money. And they make up a fake, fake case, and then they bring it to the city council, and they say, hey, here it is, this is for real, in an attempt to get you to validate it, and in an attempt to get you to spend money that doesn't exist. And I'll also submit that they've spent that same money they claim they've had several times already. Uh, for sure, number four, that money's fake. Uh, number three, 740 Alvarado Street. There's a nuisance property there. Uh, I would look at that somebody in the area had transferred money to Donald Trump or one of his family members out of Speaker, real estate. Please stay on topic. Around that area there on number, agenda item number three, 740 Alvarado. Take a good look around there. Somebody had uh, sent some money to Trump illegally through there. Uh, agenda item number six, 2817 South Hope Street, LA County. Uh, uh, fake assessor reports. Uh, there's two assessor reports that are fake. They're listed as 1969. They're no good. They were published recently. Uh, and uh, about the emergency homeless, ho emergency housing vouchers. You know that mayor is the one that caused the homeless crisis. You shouldn't be giving her money to fix the problem. That just doesn't make sense. Look at all these hotels company she has deals with. It's ridiculous. They're the ones that do that stuff. It's all illegal. Uh, general comment. Um, yeah, that's too bad. Uh, the mayor's uh, trying to issue debt for capital projects and winds up losing her ass and uh, they end up getting in trouble and you know, Triple H is just another one of those ones where LAPD is desperate for money and uh, they're illegally developing a lot of real estate. I've gone to LAPD and I've reported it to them and they said, oh no, it's something else. Uh, fully knowing what they're doing is illegal. Uh, the people in Hilton Hotels, uh, they're totally out of control. Uh, the mayor will not be able to issue bonds for the tax, re I mean, issue notes for that tax revenue because it doesn't belong to you guys. Uh, that's too bad you committed fraud. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and that closes public comment for our, um, our regular meeting. Now we're gonna close, um, we're gonna recess this first meeting. Uh, we're gonna do a roll call for our special meeting. So, um, you wanna call the roll for the special meeting? Yes, Madam Chair. Councilmember Rahman. Here. Councilmember Blumenfield. Councilmember Harris Dawson, Councilmember Rodriguez, Councilmember Lee, four members and a quorum, Madam Chair.
Okay, great. Um, and we have to move to take public comment at the second meeting. Remember, if you are speaking, you can only speak on this one special item. Uh, and we're going to start with. Um, we have a lot of the same speakers. Betty, Darren, Michelle, Betty Teodovich, Darren Hendon. If you have feel like you've already said your piece, that's fine. Uh, Darren Hendon, Peggy Lee Kennedy, Stephanie Taylor. Many of you have already spoken. Don Tavia. Okay. Okay. So somebody with the initials GND. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And so you have I just one minute for your for this comment. Go ahead. So, sorry. Uh, of course, uh, my issue will be domestic violence and their children. So I uh, have really appreciated if somehow in a way we can uh, contact you soon in order to see the, the changes regarding the, the budget that is there for sure because it's much more that it could be done and I do wanna uh, help, I am concerned, I wanna help, I wanna serve uh, the United States which I have lived here a while and it's so important to see those women really being restored, being helped, their children, and of course in a different environment, and being helped in the different areas that a woman can be uh, restored. But it's no budget there. And I have been in shelters, and believe me, uh, shelters people need to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We appreciate it. Um, we have Stephanie Taylor, I assume has already spoken, Peggy Lee Kennedy, you have one minute. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say that I think the people that are in these hotel rooms, we need to do an independent survey on uh, what their issues are, like the services they need and haven't gotten or the conditions of the rooms, because you know, they're human beings, and they deserve to be treated equally as the people sitting and making the decisions. Also, I want to say that, you know, the overtime for LAPD that's been <laughs> paid in this program is appalling. Like, if this program is voluntary, why? Why? are we paying LAPD overtime, let alone their presence, because they intimidate people by virtue of even being there. So we have to look at this program for what it really is, is sheltering people temporarily, not housing them. We need to focus on the end solution more than anything. Thank you, I appreciate that comment. Last three speakers, Michelle Torin, initials GND, and Donald Harlan. And each speaker will only have one minute to speak on this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so how come it says April 28, 2023, why wasn't it put on the regular agenda? That's what Monica always does. <laughs> she always makes sure that she puts it on the same agenda. You had time. But like typical people work for the city, they're like, oh, did you forget the April 20? Yeah, God damn it, I forgot. What, what were you doing? Well, we got a developer. He's going to be taking a bunch of us in Cancun over the summer, you know, so I got to make sure I buy my new boat, Lake Havasu, you know. Yeah, see, Speaker, that's what it on topic. is. Bob, they're all just here to steal, Bob. That's all it is. They're just all here to steal. Ramen Noodle knows it. They're dying on the streets of Sherman Oaks, Bob. Speaker, you need to They're dying on the streets, items. and she's doing nothing, Bob. Next speaker, please. Take over, Steve. Next Bob. speaker. Okay, I guess.
Yes, we're all done. Great. Closing public comment for the special meeting. And uh, I believe we have Mercedes Marquez here from the mayor's office uh, for this item. Mr. Verano, can you please read the item into the record? Item yes, one Madam on Chair. the special agenda. Item number one is a city administrative officer report relative to the homelessness emergency account fund status report for the week ending April 28th, 2023. Okay, we have Ms. Marquez, Mr. Gibson from the CAO. I, I moved that chair just so that I could see the welcome. Do you want to start by providing a brief summary of the updated report that you provide? We had a new report. The reason why we had the special agenda was because we had an updated report that came in yesterday, I believe. Um, and if you wanted to provide a brief summary or overview of that report, we can move on to some questions and discussion. Sure. Thank you. I was going to ask. We appreciate you being here. Oh, well, happy to be here. I was going to ask Ed Gibson from the CAO um, to give the overview in terms of financials and things like that. Yeah. We're happy to do that. Uh, Ed Gibson with the CAO's office. Joining me today is Kendra. Uh, as part of the team, she's going to walk us through this report. Uh, we'll give you some briefness. It was covered yes in yesterday's meeting. Uh, if you want to just go ahead and proceed, Kendra, that'd be fantastic. Good afternoon, council members. Kendra Leal with the Office of the City Administrative Officer. Um, before you today is our office's first, I'm sorry, our second report on the Homelessness Emergency Account, or HEA. The account was established by City Council and Mayor approval on January 18th, 2023 to address the city's homelessness crisis. The City Administrative Officer is authorized to spend funds as directed and approved by the mayor. As of April 28th, $395,820 has been expended of the $12,849,930 incurred. A total of $35,300,930 is expected to be expended by the end of the fiscal year based on activity between April 28th and the release of this report. Is it, it is expected to be um, to increase to $44,437,783.06 that will be obligated by the end of the fiscal year. Uh, key costs include hotel nights, LA Sorry, Grand if Extension. I just interrupt for just one second. So that Absolutely. means the total expected obligations are higher than what's in this second report as well? It's stated. Um, it's stated within the report, but yes. Okay. I'll talk to you about why. Um, so key costs include hotel nights, the LA Grand Extension, service providers, um, the LAPD overtime, and um, Department of Transportation costs for um, transporting people experiencing homelessness to hotels. And this concludes my brief presentation. Uh, thank you for your time. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I want to thank the CAO particularly this young woman, Kendra, who's incredible analyst and being of enormous help, and we appreciate her. Um, Ed, I've known for a long time, so we appreciate each other differently. <laughs> um, I would uh, want a, a good question about what we think the changes are. Um, we have, yeah. as we're understanding, uh, how we began, given that we began midstream in a budget year, um, particularly a budget year for the county. Uh, it was, we learned that the county had an underspend with their service providers. So their money, their contracts. And as we began, the county gave the go ahead to the spa leads, which we started with all six, you know, the five spa leads to use their underspend first on their dime before they charged us um, to do outreach. So what we're, what we're estimating is some savings on our side because that comes first from the underspend on the county contracts. So that, so that uh, savings will come in the loss of service provider costs line item? Yeah. So yes, so what we did is that we then reduced the amount outstanding on loss of cost and took it back. 
Um, and that, at the moment, that's our latest accounting on that. That could change again as, you know, things, as we see more numbers from them. Um, but when we saw that change, um, we made it. Um, it is also possible, though, that um, when we come back next month, um, that there will be some other things that we don't, you know, haven't yet come through formally. Um, one thing that I would watch out for is that we are changing service providers at the LA Grand from the Salvation Army, who was there during PRK, uh, and now to the Weingart Foundation, I'm sorry, to Weingart, uh, who uh, is, we think, better equipped to handle higher acuity folks with case management in the grand. So we will see that. That has a cost differential. We'll start to see that, that difference and we'll report back. Nonetheless, our intention is to wind down the LA grand this year. And hopefully, um, if we're successful and you all agree to the purchase of the Mayfair, that plus one other big item. I've mentioned it before. We, uh, we applied with, this, with the county to the state for an encampment resolution grant, a $60 million grant. Uh, and if we are successful, we will focus in on very high acuity clients in Skid Row. They will receive the highest quality of wraparound services um, that currently exist in a package. Uh, we will provide the housing through the Mayfair and our commitment would be for three years to work on throughput for 2,000 high acuity residents of Skid Row. So making what I think we would all agree is a pretty, is a historic commitment um, to that community. And packaging it with housing where they're adequately served with a service provider that can really manage that uh, high acuity of client and the county housing for health um, providing the service. There is a program in the unincorporated area of the county on Normandy in about 122nd uh, that is called Safe Landings. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to visit. It was opened by the county in January. It is a 24-7 uh, facility. They do intake all night long. They have, isol you know, they have rooms um, set aside for, for folks to, uh, to, whether it's a sobering center or it's an observation area, so that folks uh, can get better there right away and they can actually take a look then at what their true needs are. Uh, I went, I visited, it's uh, really well done. They offer interim housing there as well as all, all kinds of services, medical. If, if we are awarded this grant, uh, it will allow us to mimic and start to, uh, to really um, pilot that kind of service level in the city to understand what it would take to do it. And they would do it in Skid Row. We would also be working with the Cecil Hotel. Um, we've already negotiated, we're waiting to see. And it would provide another 100 rooms in the Cecil. It would provide the observation rooms. Uh, and at the moment, the Cecil Hotel is in negotiations with a new clinic medical clinic to open in the lobby of the Cecil. So now we would be connected, right? The clinic, the county, the city for, for these observation beds, interim housing in Skid Row, moving that forward uh, into now the LA Grand, hopefully the Mayfair, uh, to you know not only do a level of collaboration that we have not had before, um, but a level of commitment to learning what it takes. We all know that some of the issues that you have all faced in your districts is that sometimes the, the percentages of high acuity folks in, in permanent supportive housing um, supersedes the capacity of the service providers, the housers in the permanent supportive housing to manage um, a high, high level. So while we're not at all moving away from serving high acuity people, we are trying to understand better what is the right balance um, so that we appropriately uh, work with folks either because they need to increase the level of services. You know, these are all done with the county. There's different contracts uh, that make commitments about the level of service um, in each permanent supportive housing development. Um, and we're trying to learn more about what it would, 
what it would take to service very high acuity people and get them placed. So that's the beginning. That's how all of this kind of ties together. And when you are moving people, for, when you're opening them, planning to open the Mayfair or purchase the Mayfair, are you going to be moving people from the Grand to the Mayfair? We're doing two things. Um, one, because this is a program that is set for high acuity folks, we are doing, we, we'll be doing assessments of those that are in the Grand to see who qualifies and who does not as high acuity. For some of them, they will, since we have the the lease for the for the LA Grand until February 1 of 2024, those that don't meet those high acuity standards will stay at the LA Grand, right? Those that meet the standards of high acuity will move, would move to the Mayfair. Um, I, in, in the report I gave uh, yesterday, um, I spoke about uh, work that we have done already in Skid Row. So we worked with Housing for Health and moved 175 people from Skid Row into the LA Grand. And also, you've, you all saw probably downtown how we moved about another 70 folks um, in encampments around and worked with UC Street Medicine to do that. Those are some very high acuity people. That is why the Weingart Center is coming in. Uh, those that qualify, the idea would be that we would move. The others, we are already working um, to determine what their housing path is. We're tr attempting to set a standard for everyone that comes in. Um, we want to piggyback that, not only those that are an inside safe, wherever they may be, um, but we'd also like to consider that with you about tiny home villages, how we all start to set the same kind of standards um, about determining what someone's housing path is. Um, we're concerned that that has been happening too late or not at all. And so folks need assessments to understand, are they really a permanent supportive housing candidate or not? Um, do they really require that level of, of service or not? Are they someone that could live alone? Yes or no. Are they folks right, that need another kind of service? And in the future, we would also hopefully, as we work together, uh, figuring out with you, do they need a bed? Do they need a substance abuse bed? What do they need? But this is the subject now of understanding what an assessment system would look like. We're working with the county to do that, but with others as well. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions about the report before I open it up for uh, committee, other committee members as well. Um, that's not related to the information that you just shared. So you talked a lot in this, well, the report is fairly brief, and I think we discussed yesterday, and I hope that some of the reports that come in the future will have a little bit of additional information in it um, about outcomes. One of the questions I had was, you talked about housing fairs, um, but there's very little information in the report, there's no information in the report about how many people have been actually matched to permanent units or other options, whether it's, you know, bus tickets to reconnect with their family. You know, a lot, people can be rehoused in many, many different ways. Um, do you have information on throughput into the, um, the motel sites that have been utilized so far under this process? And if not, will that information be available to us going forward? Yes, it will. I spoke some yesterday in, in response to Ms. Rodriguez's questions about this issue of data. Uh, the, pretty much the things that we've done so far in the pilot of Inside Safe, um, it is important to remember it's a pilot. So when you're doing a pilot, you are learning. Sure. You are pushing through. You're trying to figure out if something is a good idea or it is not a good idea mm -hmm. for something that would you, you would continue to do. So uh, apart from housing people, we've certainly learned a lot about that. And the housing fairs, I think, um, are among them. One, I want to say there was already, you were already, the city was already doing um, mobile connect with the state and working on issues of IDs and all kinds of other things that were already happening. I think that the difference is now we're um, tying housing to that. Uh, and so when you go to a fair, um, there are places now, also now Social Security, the federal government is now also coming. That was, that's a new event. So now we have DMV, 
Mm -hmm. We have Social Security. Uh, we have some health folks, right, folks to, they can get an exam if they need one. There's a mental health uh, providers there as well if they need that. And then as they go through the system and, and they are document ready, mm -hmm. so they're either getting document ready or when they are document ready, then they move over to start looking at housing. So with all of that put through, mm -hmm. uh, they're then being offered that. I've taken a look, I went online with them, I you know, took a look at all of the things that are available there. Done overwhelmingly with some form of a voucher. Right. Okay, throughput. Um, in, in some ways there are two things. Yeah. One is LASA has a process and then PATH has a process. So folks are um, set up to go look at housing uh, on both. But they are competing, it's a Section 8 voucher. So the unit is seen by many, right? Even it might be among them looking at many to see if there's a match. What we are learning is that when you are doing housing navigation, you have to work as hard with the landlord as you do with the potential tenant mm -hmm. to agree to get over their fear, to whatever it is that they feel is a, a block, to be willing to take the unit. So this is, um, unfortunately, like most of the things th that happen with people that are vulnerable, this is a little bit more <laughs> difficult than it seems. Sure. You have to do a match. So yeah. I, once that happens, the throughput. People yes. apply, they get placed. The issue of the data, right, is one I really, I want to say this to you all with as much openness and sincerity as I can. Mm -hmm. We want the data. We want you to have the data. Mm -hmm. We want the public to have the data. Inside Safe is a new, uh, a new idea, a new program. LASA was not set up. Their data systems were not set up. Their input, everything was not set up to have an Inside Safe. So that means you can only put, you can only get data out that you can put in. So we have been working now with the actual vendor for HMIS for LASA. That's a new um, event but now working side by side with LASA, with their vendor, now with the county and the city to make sure that we can get the types, I'm not, a, I'm not an IT person or a data person, so I will get this wrong. Yeah. Um, but you understand, the idea yes. that you have the inputs that can be entered so that you can run reports. All that is being designed, it is why you were able, and I understand your uh, skepticism, but why you were able to receive a second report a month later is because we have worked with LASA and LASA has worked hard and the CAO has worked hard for three months to get the first report right. done and then a second report in a month. I know that it seems on the outside like what's your problem, but let me tell well, you that is a massive uh, Yes, win. I, I do want to say I, I feel like we're very much on the inside, all of us, because we're all working very, very closely with our providers, with our interim sites. This is not an observational you know. process for I don't think anybody on this council, and we can't afford to be because of the level of feedback that we get from our constituents on these issues. So we're with you on it. I think our question is just, and the reason I think everyone is asking is because it is a pilot, but it's a very expensive pilot, um, and it is a significant commitment from our city budget to it. Um, and we made that commitment with, with trust and with faith that we're moving into an era where we'll have a little bit more urgency, but I do think it's really important. So for these 1,205 initial placements that we saw in Inside Safe, right now what I'm understanding from what you're saying is that you don't have a number yet of how many of those people have been able to move out of those initial motel placements into permanent other, nothing, other housing solutions. Nothing that wouldn't be anecdotal. And, so and I, I do want to share that for our site, we did an Inside Safe, you know, I think it was the first Inside Safe um, that we it did. Was. We had uh, 30 people under the Coenga underpass who were ready to go indoors. You offered um, support through this program. We were excited to take it. We are able to get that data from, from our service provider there of how many people have moved from that hotel site into permanent housing, what matches have been made, and what, um, you know, what outcomes have resulted, including one person who, you know, went back, you know, was exited from the program and so on and so forth. So for us, I think 
the hope is that if we can get it at our project level, I think it can be moved up to the, in, the entire program level, um, given the number of hotels that you're working at. And I want to encourage you and to work with you to make sure that we're getting that data in the next report. Um, and whatever it takes, I think every council office would be willing that you, where you've done these programs would be, would be absolutely on board to partner with you to get that information and partner with our service providers. We to get appreci it. I appreciate it. We understand. We yep. are anxious as well and spending lots of time on it. Mm -hmm. I would say, though, that one thing is a provider giving you their report. That is not a report from HMIS. Mm -hmm. That's them giving you their report. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see lots of reports like that, but when then they run through, the numbers change. Mm -hmm. That, I, I can't give you um, anecdotal information. Mm -hmm. It must come through the HMIS system, yeah. and part of scale Right? It, it, it is it's not just counting system. one, one, one. We have to work this out. It is worth the investment of the time and the expertise that it's taking because once we do that, everyone together will be able to do so much more. So, um, but I don't want you in any way to, th to have me leave today and not know that we're not working on this every day. We are working on this every right. day. So we look forward to getting that information in the next uh, next report. I think we can get there. Um, speaking of the next report, I was wondering, I followed the budget hearings closely, and I know that you made a commitment to providing these reports. Can you just spell out how frequently the reports will be provided and in what manner they'll be provided and in which committee, so that I understand? <laughs> well, I might need a little bit of help from Mr. Blumenfield on that, but what we what we can do, and this is again based on data availability. This is not, it's not a political decision. We believe that we can get you a report with verified data once a month in writing. I have also agreed that I would come separately once a month to talk about policy program, whatever you like to talk about, um, including review of reports. So that is two monthly. Uh, so twice a month. So twice a month, one in writing, the other. I would be happy to discuss, and, I'm, and I know Ms. Rodriguez told me she'd send me something, and you, you know I'll just come talk to you, um, to receive it and, and take a look at what do I think we could give and when do I think we could provide it. Um, it may be that some of the data, as we're working with LASA and their vendor for HMIS, um, we're hoping it will be broader in terms of, like for instance, not only those that are verified in, I need to know verified out. Right? I'd like to know more about why out. We can't get that yet. I don't, there's no report in LASA yet for that. There will be. Mm -hmm. right? I would then like to know more of exactly what you just said about the throughput. Right? So for me, the first, the first item, of course, is knowing who is legitimately in the program. We've now achieved that. We think we can now have that once a month, and I can, we can trust it. The second report that we're working on, kind of equally, honestly, is those that exit for whatever reason, and then the throughput. Those are the three first data points that we would like to be able to regularly report on, mm -hmm. and we're working hard with LASA, and they're working hard to get that done. Um, I'm happy to talk with all of you about what other quality of data you're interested in, mm -hmm. and then we would work with folks and come back to you think, when do we think we would have a design for that? And I just, again, I want to say I appreciate that it may take time to set up the infrastructure to procure certain pieces of data that HMIS or the data management system is not currently set up to provide. I don't have direct access to HMIS. You know, Neither as a government we. office, we don't. But I think that once we have the infrastructure in place, and I believe that that infrastructure can be set up pretty quickly um, based on, again, how we've worked with our providers in our district, I do think that a um, twice a month report with numbers on how people are moving through this program is not uh, an impossible task. In fact, I think if we set up the system right, that should be what we should be getting from it. And, and I, I think wanna, eventually I, you would, yes. right? But I'm, I'm being as forthcoming as I can. Yeah, no, no, right and, I'm not, and I'm, I'm just saying I want to, I'm hopeful that we can get there and I think we can get there quickly. And again, I'm very happy to work with you and your team and with the LASA team uh, in order to get us there. I have a number of other questions, but I, I want to make sure that we have time for other committee members as well. 
So I want to throw open the floor for others. You have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, <clears throat> thank you. And I, I don't want to relitigate some of the conversation uh, that I raised yesterday, but I think to Ms. Rahman's point, you know, there is, the, you know, while there, the infrastructure may not be set up uh, to the degree that we are hyper-specializing the kind of report or data we want to extract from the system, the system was already structured to give us reports. We got them on a uh, biweekly basis from LASA with respect to our roadmaps effort. And so, you know, for me, um, you know, the verbal reports are fine, uh, but I'd rather see it in writing. And I'd rather delineate explicitly who's doing what, when, and with what money. Because when we talk about, uh, well, you know, the county had underspent, and I see all of these uh, allocations for outreach services, it, bears, it, it begs the question, and, and to Mr. Blumenfield's point, uh, you know, Ms. Horvath has sent us uh, sub additional uh, information with respect to uh, some of the funds that are being used. It, it frankly blurs rather than clarifies uh, how much we're spending on what. And so, uh, again, I, I, you know, I've made the, the comment uh, multiple times in terms of getting more clarity on it um, so that, you know, for me, it's really about uh, providing, I, you know, I, I don't think it's an impossible task for a $50 million allocation, let alone a $250 million allocation, to get uh, bi-monthly, you know, to get, uh, you know, reports every two weeks in writing uh, there, God knows there's enough people making money on this stuff that we should be able to really understand who's doing what, where, and with what money. Um, that's, you know, we are a city of, we are the uh, second largest city in the nation, in the state with the fourth largest economy. Someone can figure it out. Uh, between the money that LASA takes uh, from the city and from the county, I think everybody, if we're, if we're truly going to have greater transparency and accountability, that should be easy. But uh, so, you know, again, I'm not going to monopolize uh, any more of the time on this. I made my comments yesterday. Um, but, you know, a constituent of mine provided me a map of the city and indicated for the San Fernando Valley, which, as you know, represents approximately half of the population in the city of Los Angeles. 90% uh, of the San Fernando Valley has had no uh, effort with respect to inside safe. And it's problematic. And I, I say this again because um, it, it, uh, when we talk about haves and have-nots and we talk about, you know, uh, the resources that are coming that are funding these pilots, and I, you know, again, this, this pilot, uh, you know, I remember when we first sat down and had the conversation, your words were, we're not doing any more pilots, but I understand we're, we're refining this process. Um, there's a whole half of the city that is yet to see and understand and ascertain how this works, how the, how the encampments are identified. Some areas have jumped the queue, uh, and it, you know, it's just there's, there's a lack of clarity around where and why. And, you know, when there are a number of outreach efforts, separate and apart from Inside Safe, that are being conducted by spa leads, that are being, con you know, uh, through LASA, and so I, again, I just, I need, you know, I, the roadmap for the process needs to be developed. As you're doing this work, um, it needs to, you know, when, when we did the RV pilot, we mapped out step one, step two, step three, how does this all work? Because that's how you actually evolve something from a pilot into a citywide adoptive effort. So, you know, uh, my office, working with the CLA, working with uh, the CAO's office, we did that for the RV pilot. We did that for Paxton and Bradley. Uh, we've done all those pieces. And I think for this part, given that there was substantial money associated with this effort, we need to see that, uh, the, at least the beginnings of an outline. Uh, because when we're talking about another $250 million, uh, you know, it would be malpractice to not have that. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just want to leave it with that. And uh, and I because I know my colleagues have other uh, questions, but uh, again, you you will be in receipt of uh, more explicit detail about uh, the information I expect to see in these reports going forward um, that further delineate, and especially because uh, when I when I think about residents in the city of Los Angeles, uh, 
and, and just aggregating out the, the additional tax assessments that many of the residents said yes to, whether it was in uh, AH or HHH. Uh, their tax dollars are already going to providing these basic fundamental service, whether it's provided by the county with their obligation or with respect to the work that we're doing here in the city. When we talk about an overall you know, $1 billion investment citywide, um, we need to make sure that every, every dollar that we're, that we're utilizing is being utilized effectively, that we have greater transparency and outcomes associated with each dollar that's spent uh, on this effort. So um, I'm just gonna leave it at that. And thank I'll you. Allow my colleagues to um, my I, I actually, thank you for your comment, Ms. Rodriguez. I was wondering whether I could just take a piece of your comment and ask, ask a question from it, which is Ms. Rodriguez brought up site selection in you know, San Fernando Valley. Could you talk a little bit about that process? I know that you made a comment, but I would love to just hear a little bit more about how are decisions being made about when and where to do an inside safe operation, how are sites selected, how are council offices selected for this partnership? Because um, I think there's curiosity about that. So a quick look back. Um, those of you that trusted us first, that's how the site, <laughs> that had a lot to do with how site selection began. So those of you that said yes, we'll try, um, you're, right, we went there. So that is why we started with you, Ms. Raman, and we're very <laughs> so grateful. while we were desperate for beds. Right, no, but that is why we've been in, with Mr. Blumenfield, because he trusted us to try in the riverbed. That is why we've been with Mr. Harris Dawson. Um, and so we started with those, okay, that's a look back. Um, as we move forward, Right there are there are clearly criteria. Obviously, we're going to be we're guided by where um, are the concentrations mm -hmm. of homelessness. Um, I wish I could tell you that 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 it would stop at its purest form, but very soon we we learned that every level of capacity was tested. Uh, the service provider capacity has been tested and stretched. So we are now hearing um, from many, they need a lot more time between operations. They don't have it. They're just being honest. I can't move that quickly. We can't absorb it that quickly. We, you know, we need a little bit more time. So we are actually matching among the criteria is need, where is their capacity in the service provider um, uh, you know, world? Uh, how, and then the big thing, finding the, the motels is incredibly difficult. Um, this is a voluntary program, so some want to work with us, some don't. So we look at that. We have to look at price point, right? What's going on with that? Uh, uh, and then we begin to see which comes together. We also don't want to be in a position where we rent rooms well ahead where they're not being used. So this is about m mixing and matching all over the place. Uh, so right now, that issue of capacity did not, everyone had capacity when we began. Now it is limited and we're mixing and matching. An example of that, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that, and this is why I'm putting it out on the table. To do downtown, right, uh, PATH, who, which has, is the spa lead for that area, said to us, we just don't have the capacity to go out there and do that outreach and get them off the street. We don't have it. But we still wanted to do it. We hadn't been there yet. Big need. So we used the USC Street Medicine contract, wonderful folks, I think we should do more of that. We used USC Street Medicine, went with us, they already had a lot of clients there. So we went with them, we went with LASA uh, outreach folks and together worked that area. And then when we moved them to the LA Grand, then PATH said we don't have the capacity on the street, but we will have the capacity once they're in the hotel to do the case management. So, so, it, it, so it sounds like going forward, you're, you're saying it will be a combination a of combination. opportunity and capacity in terms right. of where you're moving for right. inside but, safe. But what we're wanting to do now is have a list of 10 sites at a time across all of these areas. Working with you all, you have probably received, I don't well, you may not have seen it, but your, your staff, you received from us well, about six weeks ago maybe, a form, a yes. Google form saying, please tell us what your top you know, three or four sites are so we can begin. And we're drawing from them mm -hmm. as, we, as we understand where we need to go. 
So it will be a combination of what you have sent us. I will send it probably every quarter so you can update it, things change, where, what it is you're interested in. We'll then see where we are with service providers, where we are with housing, all of the things. We'll work the 10. As on the 10, as they, whatever comes up, what we're able to get Kismet on first, they will move up, we'll get them done, we'll add another if we did two, we'll add another two to the list from all of the things that we're gathering and always be working 10 so that we can take advantage of any thing that fits, that fits better to do it. At the same time then, as we move forward, if the, if the budget is approved, then we'll be in a position to start uh, to do longer term leasing and purchases so that we take out not only cost, but also the uncertainty of not having the housing. I have spoken to some of you already, I've, I know I've spoken with you and I spoke to Lisa, Mr. Bloomfield, about the possibility of, if you're willing, those that can, add one of your, think about adding one of your tiny home villages to Inside Safe, right? Working together to get that throughput for them and then being in a position to use that tiny village as the interim housing that we work a chain across, right, for inside safe so that we lower the costs everywhere and we get a better sense of what we're doing. It will, even as we begin this process, if you approve the budget and we move forward, the first bit is still going to be pilot-like because we're still learning. We're still trying to understand how to lower the cost. You and I spoke about an RFP for people to apply with hotels. We probably need a minimum of 60 rooms. So all kinds of things that, that we will try. Pretty much Anything that makes sense, we're willing to try. Mm -hmm. So that's the way we're looking. Um, I know we went with your staff this week. That's going to be something. Miss Rodriguez has a site. No one, I've seen it years ago, Miss Rodriguez, when I worked in the federal government. I saw farm workers living in places like that where they dug in caves. That is the last time I've seen something mm -hmm. like that. That's going to be, we want to talk to you more about that because we think that's going to take something very special about helping those people be willing to, to leave. So I looked at it, I'm like, wow. Thank you. And I would appreciate, um, as we move forward, just including that discussion about site selection and prioritization and how we're doing it as part of our reporting and discussion on this. Again, as we move forward, we want to create a program that's really fleshed out, that's clear, that we can wrap our arms around, and that's that's what I'm hoping to do. Others on this committee, do you have questions? Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, conversation. In, in terms of you got you were asking about the budget and what that required, just, just to be clear, the way the language is, it said um, one report to be heard at each regular meeting of the Housing Homes Committee. One report will include the financial aspects of Inside Safe including actual and planned expenditures, and one will include programmatic elements of inside safe. But that's the big picture. And we weren't too prescriptive because we want this committee to help define what those things will be. Um, I certainly want to have things like the per person, per room, per day costs, per the different types of housing, the services that are offered at each site, um, the housing and navigation slots that are assigned, a breakdown of the cost between the hotel motel and, and the ongoing roadmap efforts that focuses on building the interim sites, a breakdown in tracking of the county services offered, referrals offered, accepted, and report to include county contributions for inside safe operations, departments involved, types of services offered, and referrals to county services so that we get that, that big picture. And I think we were, we were getting at that question, uh, and both my colleagues who have spoken have talked about this, is that the county money can sometimes blur the mm -hmm. transparency rather than <laughs> make it more clear. And we, we want to know not just how much we're putting in, but how much are we spending per person and, and what is it, what is the effectiveness of, sorry. Uh, uh, I'll wait, wait till the gentleman leaves. Sorry. And, okay. Um, Get a little distracted, but but obviously these these are the kinds of things that we want to. We know we're not going to get it right away. In terms of the data, this is more for the CAO. I, I know getting data out of LASA is a challenge. Um, 
so I wanted to know how you're going to resolve this given there's a desire for council to receive more detailed data and if getting data from LASA is, LASA is hindered uh, in this reporting, are we looking at alternative data systems for the city or are we going to just wait for LASA to fix the data problem? Can't quite hear the mic. There we go. Data is a challenge. Data is unequivocally challenged. I think uh, uh, Mercedes Marquez just said, mentioned that been working with LASA on, on updating their systems. I think if you go back a little bit ways, we actually approved some money in our budget like earlier this year, end of last year, to even provide additional funding to enhance their systems at LASA. And that was a little bit even ahead of Inside Safe. And so, we're working with them. We're working with the mayor's office. We are looking at other methods. I will even say earlier today, we were having a conversation about how we can process even just some of the motel invoices. Things are very, very manual or very labor intensive to get answers back and we have to get them all the way through. Mm -hmm. We've also had a large number of conversations with um, ITA uh, they've been very helpful in trying to make some of the different systems that work across departments, how they can extract their data so we can, we can get it into one place to take, to take a view because every department seems to be using their own data and most of them have some type of good data but getting it regularly and reliably and then verifying it, I can't tell you how hard it is to verify things. Even when we have a conversation about throughput, and if the system isn't built to capture that data, then you end up using some type of footnote or something else which is helpful, but then people actually have to have the type of access to go into data that may have some security type issues to verify, working with the service providers. Um, it's been a challenge, but I will say yes, we're looking at internal. We're working together with mayor's office in, in Lhasa. We are looking at things what we can do internally to do that. And, and, and I know I've had conversations with even your staff who's been very helpful about what other systems might be out there that we can actually just plain incorporate if, if they can work better over, mm -hmm. over the top. So as those discussions continue to evolve and as I said, s send them, and I say yeah. that for everybody, I don't mean to be, um, it seems, it send seems them because I'm telling you that you know, you have this myriad of web and making them talk together or just making three of them talk together sometimes uh, would be a, a, a heavy If thing. I could just, yeah, if I could just say one thing, which is I think this is a committee that wants to get into the weeds. And so seeing, for example, you don't have to show an individual on HMIS, but showing what data HMIS collects through, you know, through the screens, showing what data is collected through the invoicing process and where it is. I think mapping all that out putting that on the screen here, this, this can and should be part of our discussions. We want to be involved and we want to make it better. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I will just add, you know, even as we have this conversation, we must have additional data type fields so that when a question is simple and as complex as who's inside safe, it is not a, a long trying question for LASA to want to have to produce because I'm going to say they all want to do it. That's, and I love that. But if we're all living in that same limited situation, we've got to have the appropriate system to capture this so it's searchable, um, searchable by various things. So a, a lot of, <laughs> Chief Marquez has said a, a lot of the things, but it is, it is absolutely the challenge that is sitting there today. So, but yes, yeah. to outside data systems, yes, yes, and yes. And, and just to put a finer point out, I mean, it's way more complicated than it needs to be in, so, in many yeah, respects. Yeah. And I know that even in this budget, we're putting 13 more positions at a cost of $1.67 million that we're giving to LASA for data, for data explicitly. Um, so, I, I mean, are we even going to get access to the data given to the LACOC that has to grant the city permission to access the data that the city is paying for? Yeah. We're actually negotiating that. Yeah, but I mean, you think we should have some leverage here given that it's our pocketbook. <laughs> I mean, I, more than I leverage, would, we I should would, be dictating I want to it. be as diplomatic as I can. I would say that people are feeling our leverage. Okay, well, whatever we can do to help turn the heat up on that, and part of it is raising it here in this public committee. Mm -hmm. uh, it's part of it is to have the discussion with you all, but also uh, I know folks from LASA are here and they can, they can hear this discussion. We are, we are all very dead set and serious about getting the information um, we're on the front lines. No. 
all of us. I'll, I'll throw thank back. you. Go ahead, Mr. Harris Dawson. Uh, thank you so much, uh, and thank you uh, for uh, your report today and what you've been shared with us and the forthright rightness which, which, with which you've all have answered tough questions. I think I agree with the spirit of uh, all the questions in the back and forth of my colleagues that have spoken before. Uh, it, you know, it's, again, uh, I think I'm sometimes known for being bombastic, but it's, it's a little, it's incredible is the word I'll use, <laughs> um, given the investment and where we are. I mean, we're not in Wichita, Kansas, we're in Los Angeles. One of the data technology capitals of the world that we can't figure out this, uh, figure out how to get the data. Like I, I know, and I, and it's also troubling. Like it sounds like all of us have different things. So like I'm looking out on a phone, a list of all of our insights safe people, what documents they have, what documents they don't have. I can't say, I knew we, we're getting it from the MDD team. I understand that that's not verified, but it's like, we've got this one thing cause we're working with these people. They've got something else. They've got something else. And uh, it just seems like this can come together. Um, I, I want to ask a couple, uh, uh, a series of pointed questions um, because, mm, let me uh, contextualize it this way. During my time on the council, homelessness has been the is issue the entire time. The overwhelming majority of the time that LASA comes up, it's in a negative way or it's some kind of shortcoming. Uh, and we keep coming back to the same thing. Uh, so, so I'm just trying to get a feel for uh, what you all sense of now that you've tried Inside Safe, which is involved, you know, and I, I frankly congratulate you for it uh, as opposed to put a magnifying glass on it. You all have had to do a good amount of improvisation, figuring stuff out as you go. But part of the reason you have to do that is because of Lhasa. Part of the reason it's not straightforward is because of Lhasa. Um, so I, I'm just, want to hear your thoughts about how far you think we go with that you know when do we actually make the move away I mean I, I think Mr. Blumenfield said you know we're footing the bill or a lot of the bill um, because it it's just it's hard to continue to have discussions and have the same thing come up every time whether it's what the out the level of the outreach workers I know firsthand why people want to hire different outreach workers I, I've I understand that very clearly. Um, and now we have this problem with data that we're invoking Lhasa's name as if they have control of it. Um, you know, is that control legal? Do they have to be the ones that have the data? Because um, I, I just, I feel like that's gonna, that has been the case since we've been, since I've at least been involved or in the weeds on homelessness. Uh, and, I, and I don't want it to be the case going forward. I, I want to be, fair. Um, there is a lot of l vision at LASA. Um, there are a lot of great ideas and there's a lot of good programming and a lot of dedicated people there. I, I have seen uh, we support Dr. Adams. We, I, my sense is that where she wants to take this organization is really um, people oriented. She is an outreach person in her heart and in her bones. So she will drive this uh, to the base level, I think, in a very good way. I've also heard wonderful things about their, that they're doing as it relates uh, to black people experiencing homelessness, where they're leading. Now focusing in on Latinos, a, a new program on Latinos and homelessness and understanding that. I think there are a lot of very good things. They have, for many years, um, been just a pass-through organization uh, and of money. And I think what, we're, what we get to talk about is the hard administrative things of LASA, not some of the other leading ideas things where they, you know, where they are leaders. So I want to make sure you that that's true. But I think what we're talking about here is the bread and butter of what uh, a partner where LASA has the authority and the dollars that they have have to be able to provide. They know this. Dr. Adams Kellum knows it. She's, she's, I believe her when she tells me she's committed to change it. That is data. It is document readiness. 
It is housing navigation, invoicing, and reporting. That is, to me, the on-the-ground things about LASA that, with all of us together, must absolutely be transformed. I be they know that. And I believe that now that there is this type of an effort that is testing all that. It's never been great. I, you know, when I was the director, the general manager of the housing department way back in the day, that was an issue back then. And I had a nonprofit come and put like 10 boxes in front of me and say they couldn't get paid, right? That they had over a million dollars in invoices that hadn't been paid. So I lived it way back then. I think that's improved to some, I, I think I want to give them their due, I think it's improved, but there's no question that these basic things still have to be worked on. So from my point of view, sir, this is the year, right? Because there is no way out, right? We must have the reporting. We must have the data. We must design to have the input in so that we can get it out. So I think, you know, where it, the rubber has hit the road, in other words, because of, of all the work that you have all already done, and now the very intense work that I hope that we will continue to do together. Well, thank you for that. I, I, I uh, trust, hope and trust that you, that you all will approach this challenge with the same uh, urgency that you've approached uh, encampments. Um, because again, we've just been at it a long time. We have a to. Lot, a lot, a of, lot, a of, lot of money. And I, you know, at least I want to speak for myself, when I say a lot of money is being spent, I don't mean to imply someone's fraudulently getting rich off of homelessness. What I mean, what I mean to say is, money goes in, and it, it's never entirely clear what comes out of it. Uh, and then, so we have that on that side, and then you have the gentleman who just disrupted the meeting who said, "Well, I'm a, I've been on Skid Row. I don't see any money," and I understand that because mm -hmm. um, it's hard to 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 track where it's been. Um, secondly, and completely unrelated uh, to that, because I I just want to register that. I'm troubled by the notion that when when we say, oh, we want data, which from my point of view, you should be able to get daily. Like it it should be able to live update. It just doesn't seem that complicated. Uh, and it shouldn't require you co somebody coming and reading something to us. Like we should just be able to mm -hmm. access it. Um, but, but what I don't, what I'm concerned about is that six months from now, we'll say, oh, well, such and such and such and such a Lhasa. Like I, you know, that just feels like an old song at this point. Um, so I, I want us to move move uh, past that. Uh, so uh, on a totally separate note, um, one of the other things, I know this is about people and making sure we pull people off the streets, stabilize them as much as we can and move them into housing and, and hope that they return to to, um, to be uh, members of society in a more traditional way. Uh, but the one thing that is compelling about the Insight Safe program that I'm wondering if anybody is counting is actually the encampments. Right, so, you know, getting off the freeway at Kawanga for Hollywood Farmers Market and not seeing people living there is, frankly, more of us experience that than experience getting housing. And I just wonder if you all have, amongst all the things you're doing, um, is anybody keeping track of that? Like, how, how is the encampment clearing actually working? So I know yeah. where you've done Inside Safe in the 8th, we, we go back and check literally every day to see if it's repopulating. Uh, others around the city that I have knowledge of, I, I definitely look when I'm there. Anybody keeping track of that? What have you all learned uh, about that part of the work? Uh, we, we are keeping track within, um, within the resources we currently have that's difficult. Um, if you approve the budget, there is a clear line through to that, right? Uh, w let me say a little bit more about that. It's not just about having an outreach worker that goes to look, right? We're talking about a community engagement strategy uh, that starts to engage the churches, that starts to engage neighbors um, to be able to take back and keep those places clear. So it's not just about an outreach worker in the classic way going by. We're talking about something much, much bigger uh, about, I know Mr. Harris Dawson, you know a lot about, but that's the direction um, that we're going. We do go visit, and, and amazingly, so far, so good. I don't know if we've just, I don't want, you know, I want to, I don't know if we've just been lucky so far, but so far the encampments are pretty clear. Uh, and when we hear of something, we go and, and look. 
um, but thus far, and I believe that that would not at all be possible, not in any way, shape, or form, if it wasn't that we were engaged with each of you as we go, right, and, and, do, these, and, and do these encampment resolutions, that all of us together are watching. Your staffs, our staffs, everybody is watching to make sure. So I, I wouldn't want to at all take credit for it. It is an absolute group sport um, that, we're all <laughs> that we're all engaged in to look. And so far, so good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think that is the end of our questions. I'm sure we have a lot more, but I just want to make a commitment to you, Mr. harris Dawson. I hope I will work my hardest to make sure that in six months we're not still at the same place with loss of data um, and that we are in a better place. And I know uh, that, Ms. Marquez, you're going to do the same thing, so I'm excited to partner with you on that. I want to say thank you for answering all of these questions. We come to these questions not because we don't want this program to go forward. I think it matches the urgency that this council has felt and, and feels around how we respond to homelessness. It is because we care so deeply about this program that we want nothing more than for its success and for, this, for its success for the city of Los Angeles and for all of us. And so we come to this, I think, with a shared sense of urgency focus um, and with a shared sense of wanting to get it right uh, because these are big dollars, these are people who are being impacted, and we want to make sure we're doing the right thing here collectively. So thank you again for coming. We really appreciate your um, responses. We look forward to seeing you next time. See you next month. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you to the CAO as well for both of you and, and for your reports. Thank um, you So very much. with that, I want to, um, do we have to vote to note and file this? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take a vote on this item to note and file this item. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Bloomfield. Bloomfield, aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Four eyes, and this item is noted and filed. Thank you very much. And with that, we're going to adjourn the special meeting, and we're going to resume our uh, regular meeting. We Would need to call the roll again? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. Councilmember Rahman. Here. Councilmember Blumenfield. Present. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Present. Councilmember Rodriguez. Here. Councilmember Lee. Councilmember Lee is absent. Four members and a quorum, Madam Chair. Great. Um, and I'm going to recommend for these, uh, for these items, unless there are questions that we take um, 1 through 8 and item 10 on consent. So just hearing a presentation on number 9. Oh, okay. Do you want to read that into the record? Sure. Do you think it requires discussion? So it okay. Shouldn't be, Go ahead. Yeah. Shouldn't be controversial. Yeah. Um, but uh, just just wanted to make sure, and uh, just given the context of some of the concerns that were raised, um, I wanted to include that the motion was amended to uh, report back from the housing department and relevant city departments, identifying the percentage of pre-1980 residential units lacking the sub-metering and assess the potential consequences on the ratio utility billing systems if the mandatory installation of cooling systems were to be implemented. Uh, <clears throat> additionally, I'd like to request a report back from the Department of Water and Power regarding an estimate of the potential implications on the city's electrical grid if every unit in Los Angeles were equipped with a cooling system. And then finally, uh, that the housing uh, department and relevant city departments conduct a comprehensive case study on an average size pre-1980 building. The objective of the study would be to estimate the costs associated with the installation of cooling systems and analyze the potential impacts on tenants, taking into consideration factors such as construction work, disruptions, and any related inconveniences that may arise from, from implementing. Okay, great. Um, you want to Second that amendment, or you have an additional amendment? I, I'm happy to second it, but I, I'd like to add one, uh, one little friendly okay, addition I'll, to it. Okay, I'll second that amendment, and then we can go ahead. You can uh, introduce your amendment. The this well, is for to, item eight. Yeah, this is just adding on to Ms. Rodriguez's amendment. Okay. If, if appropriate, to add in to include in the report that uh, LA Housing Department to create options to prioritize people based on geography slash weather. Uh huh. Right. Hottest yeah. areas. Hottest district, 121 district degrees. Is the it's, if we're going okay. to do okay. this versus Venice, <laughs> where you can keep your windows open, where do you start? Yes. So let's okay. Let's have some That's, options. I'm comfortable. So let's. Um, <laughs> I'll second that as well. Um, and so let's vote on items one through. Uh, yeah. You have one more. No, no. Well, I have. Well, you can go.
single, but I, there were five and six I have questions on. Oh, you have questions? On five and six, yeah. Okay, so let's vote on items uh, one through four, uh, eight as amended, and ten. Yes? Okay, great. Oh, oh wait, and seven. So sorry, one through four. Um, we're going to leave five and six and nine on the table. Item seven, item eight as amended, and item ten. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and to confirm, did you want to note and file um, item number 10 as well? Yes, that's right. And I believe one and four are note and files as well. Great. Thank Great. you very much. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Councilmember Lee is absent. Four ayes, and these items are approved with eight as amended, and one, four, and ten noted and filed. Okay, great. So I'm going to move to item nine um, because we have representatives from Hakla here, and I believe at least one person from the public who's still here who has questions. If you can read item nine into the record, please. Item number nine is a Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles report relative to expedited, expediting leasing for emergency housing voucher program participants. Great. So um, Hakla representatives are coming to the desk. Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I want to thank our HACLA partners for sending um, weekly reports on um, EHV uh, allocations and lease-ups. Uh, those have been really illuminating for us and um, I think have been really helpful in, in trying to figure out how we can, how we can move forward here. Uh, we had a report on the council file in response to our motion uh, we asked some questions and asked for a secondary report because we wanted some clarity uh, on the original report and we're happy to see that you submitted an additional report on May 2nd which did answer a few more questions and showed more progress on matching these vouchers. Um, so I want to thank you both for coming back to this committee and uh, if you'd like to, um, you know, share some top line findings from your report. Uh, we can ask some questions from the committee. Yes, good afternoon. Is that on the mic? I think it's on automatically. Just pull it closer to you. Good there afternoon. Go. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm Margarita Laris from the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles. I'm the Chief Programs Officer. Um, I work in the Executive Office with our president and CEO, Doug Guthrie. Um, with me today is Carlos Venera, who's our director of Section 8. Um, thank you again for the invitation, and we made every effort to respond to the many questions that you had. Uh, we understand that we operate programs that are somewhat complex, and just to put on context as a reminder that the Housing Authority does administer several different types of voucher programs that we are able to assist uh, the constituents of Los Angeles with. We have the, the major program, which is the Housing Choice Voucher Program with about 50,000 vouchers there. We have the VASH program. And we also, in the last uh, 10 years, have been doing project-based vouchers as well. Mm -hmm. And very recently, um, we got an allocation of emergency housing vouchers that were awarded um, to the City of Los Angeles and to specifically to the Housing Authority. As with all the vouchers that are, there's a, the need for vouchers and the need for housing assistance is much greater than the resource that we have. We received 3,365 vouchers, which was I believe the second largest allocation in the country, New York City getting the largest. And, of, of course, uh, the program was oversubscribed from day one. For the 3,365 vouchers, we actually got over 7,000 applications of individuals really needing this resource. Um, from our last report, um, from our initial report and our amended report of May 2nd, um, the numbers have increased. We have, uh, besides issuing all the vouchers, as we previously reported, to the committee, we have actually leased 1,917 individuals that are now have a roof over their head. Oh, even since May 2nd? 
um, and that is as of May uh, last Friday. 1,917. Thank you. We have uh, another 370 um, units that individuals have actually found somewhere to live. We're in the process of inspecting those units, negotiating contract rents with owners, and we are on pace of, of finalizing those contracts with those owners in the coming weeks as well. And we still have people that are looking ho with, for housing. Their vouchers are still um, in, in process and we have approximately oh, 1,800 individuals still looking for housing. Um, I think I'm going to pass it over to Carlos, who's going to speak a little bit about how we're helping the 1,800 or so individuals that still have a voucher. Mm -hmm. Yes, hello, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, we do continue to make progress, leasing every week, getting new people on the program. We do have 1,864 people on the street with a voucher looking for housing right now. Um, generally, the model has been from the beginning that the referrals came to us for EHV from LASA, and LASA was providing the case management so families could get all the paperwork together, submit it to us, help with housing search assistance. What we're finding is much more needs to be done in that regard. So what the Housing Authority is doing is we are setting up a team, hiring a team now of six people that will be housing navigators to help people locate units because the big thrust at this point is to connect the voucher holders with the individual units. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, you know, everyone who gets a voucher from us in EHV has had up to a year to look for a unit. A lot of those vouchers now, some of them are beginning to expire. And so we are expiring those vouchers and we're bringing new people on the program. We need to do that by September 30th because that's the last time by which we can issue new vouchers. Um, the folks who will be um, receiving a letter that says your voucher is being um, withdrawn because it expires will get the opportunity to have one additional month to look for a unit, 30 days. Um, if it's a family, <clears throat> excuse me, with a reasonable, uh, that requires a reasonable accommodation due to disability, they could get longer than that. But we need to um, work with that group and then issue additional vouchers. So we are working now at um, issuing additional vouchers up to 300 and we could go a bit more depending on the success rate that we see in the next couple of months um, to make sure that we can fully utilize this allocation of 3,365. Uh, our goal was to um, use all of these vouchers by the end of the year by December 31st but on the track we're going right now we expect to get there by first part of October. So we're really working at monitoring this um, so and that's complete utilization of all 3,365. Correct, correct, yes. Um, because we do have an aggressive leasing push in the program. Um, staffing has always been an issue because there is turnover. It's a temporary program. It's hard to keep temporary folks uh, in place for that. We shift over our own staff as needed mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that we continue to do the work we need to do. Um, so. We are monitoring closely the success rate, the number of people whose vouchers expire, bringing on new folks to fully utilize all 3,365. And if I may add, sure. um, besides the, the team that we have, we've hired the individuals, we're just waiting for their start date to begin, that will be contacting the voucher holders, telling them about units that we have identified. We've been using a broker. We have a broker under contract at the Housing Authority that their sole job is to locate units throughout the city of Los Angeles and match them to the individuals that have a voucher. Um, to further supplement that, we are in the process of contracting with a third party. It's a vendor that does relocation services and housing locator services that's very familiar to the city of Los Angeles. They do a lot of work in our city and we are hopeful that we will take it to our board on May 31st for approval as well. So everything that we could possibly do, we are doing now. It's a reminder, you know, Hackle is not a city department. We do not utilize city funds. We are not in the city budget either. So our funds come from the federal government and we operate the program within the parameters of of the federal funding. 
Thank you. Um, despite the fact that you are not city funded, I still have a hope that we can utilize every single voucher Absolutely. that's been allocated to us and that, that we is can, our goal. Yes. Mm -hmm. you know, we can walk with you to that goal. Um, I want to just talk through a little bit uh, before opening up to the rest of the committee on the weekly lease up numbers that you've been providing. Um, the report has some details about it and we've seen some real changes in the last few weeks. Um, we saw, you know, numbers like 33, 37 a week, um, even in March. And suddenly in April, uh, we're seeing a big jump, 107 units being leased up, 74, 92. These are big changes. Is there something that you can share with us that accounts for why these numbers are going up so much just in the last few weeks? Sure. Well, I think a number of things are coming together that we've been uh, working to get into place. Part of it has been staffing. Part of it has been really working through the group of um, families and individuals who have submitted a request for tenancy approval, which is the paperwork they need uh, that is submitted by the landlord. We've gotten through that backlog that we had, and we're getting to a point of more timely throughput. As an RFTA comes in from a, a landlord, we want to work on that as quickly as possible and inspect and authorize people to move in. And all of this is starting to come together now. It's taken a little time getting our, our staffing in place to do it, but some of these pieces are starting to come together. We also now have um, small area fair market rents that allow for higher rents in three tiers in 75 zip codes in the city. We have We're smaller what? Small area fair market rents. Oh, okay. So um, if I could step back, we have a citywide voucher payment standard that we offer for units. Uh, we can go beyond that in certain zip codes, uh, 75 zip codes in the city that can take a one bedroom, for example, from around $2,100 to offering a landlord up to $3,000 in certain zip codes if supported by comparable rents in the neighborhood. And we have seen an uptick in landlords willing to work with us okay. and rent in new areas that we haven't worked in before. So. These are mainly higher opportunity areas like West LA, North and West San Fernando Valley, Northeast City. Uh, there's at least one Harbor zip code in there as well. So that's helping as well. And I would Is, like to add that we also added some additional uh, support by bringing in a, a vendor that's helping with processing the paperwork and reaching okay. out to landlords as well. Okay. That's correct. Um, mm -hmm. if, if we are getting inputs, including, as you saw in public comment today, questions from case managers and from agencies that are working on these issues about particular frustrations that they're having with, the, with HACLA as a whole or with particular individuals who are trying to get resolution for their cases. What is the best way for us as a council, us as a council office, or you know, as a city to be able to address those issues and, and problem solve with you? Well, I can tell you certainly that, um, and some of the council members here have reached out directly in the past. You know, we have a constituent that walked into Yes, their, we've done that. Uh, I'm kind of asking what is the best way? Like, we have reached out to you and you've been helpful. Is there a path that you would recommend that we follow going forward so that we can kind of consolidate issues and then bring them to you? Yes, we do have um, an email address that any referral can come into us. Um, that's ehv.referrals at hacla.org. Um, we clear that uh, throughout the day and we farm it out to our staff who can respond back to either an applicant or a landlord or a case manager that has issues. As Margarita said, we do get direct inquiries from, from all of you and uh, I'll reach out with the group that was here that had some issues because mm -hmm. we want to resolve every one of them and work individually with the agencies and also with the landlords at uh, making sure these contracts can be executed. Is there a phone number that people can call or only an email address? No, we have a phone number. What's the phone number that people can call to resolve these issues? We also have our customer contact center at HACLA4U. Um, it's 888 okay. HACLA4U, and those inquiries are. Um, responded to directly on the phone or referred to the unit and the individual worker who can assist. Okay. Um, and then we've heard from a number of stakeholders um, that communication during the voucher lease-up process continues to be a, a point of concern. 
With EHVs, I think you're, as far as I can understand it, you're dealing with three distinct groups that are reaching out to you about those vouchers. One is the individual who's holding the voucher, either a person experiencing homelessness or someone at risk, the service provider or their case manager, and the landlord. Correct. How are you managing those inquiries? How do you, you know, are they all reaching out to the same staff within HACLA? How, how is that, you know, how, how is that process organized and how are you making sure that these three parties are also communicating with each other? It is a challenge to work with all three of those parties because you're right, all, all three of them need to be involved. And keeping everyone in the loop in real time uh, is what we constantly are working at and striving for. And I work directly with the office and with the staff to keep that communication up. Um, so it, it, is, it is key that we keep everyone in the loop because we may be talking with the landlord, but the tenant doesn't know what's going on. The case manager might not know. So um, they're trying to work in a more coordinated way in assisting individual clients and keeping everyone in the loop as to what's going on as the unit. Inspection and contracting process moves forward. Okay. And I would request that in your next return to this committee that you're able to share a little bit more about the process that you're developing for that, because I think that's something that needs to be institutionalized within HACLA. I want to open up the floor for other committee members if there's questions. Okay. And I'm excited to hear that you feel that you're going to be on track to lease up all of these units by uh, September or October. Um, yes. And I would again push, and I know I've been pushing this from the beginning, over issuing more than you feel comfortable on this because I think there will be other methods through which people who are getting these vouchers, we can support them with other forms of um, you know, rental support. But I would really, really think that at this moment, we can't afford to send a single voucher back to DC. This is just not a moment that we can afford to do that. And I think over issuing to me feels like the way forward in order to be able to make sure that we're holding on to those resources and that we can next year ask for more resources um, from the federal government. So, you know, I, I want to make that push again. And I know you're yes. saying uh, that agreed. you are. Agreed, yes. Um, we are and we'll continue. Yes. And yes. I appreciate that you've already increased the number of vouchers that you're issuing um, at, in response to questions from this committee. That's great. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing more progress. So thank you to you both. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, and is there anything, any action we need to take on that? Uh, note and file? Note and file, okay. So uh, if we could call the roll to note and file that item. Councilmember Rahman? Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield? Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson? Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez? Yes. Councilmember Lee? Councilmember Lee is absent, four ayes, and this item is noted and filed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's move on to item five. Uh, could you read that item into the record, please? Item number five is a city administrative officer report relative to the 17th report regarding COVID-19 homelessness roadmap funding recommendations and related matters. And I believe we have uh, people from the CAO here to uh, answer questions. Back again. Thank you. Welcome. Great. Um, and. Uh, you know, do you need a presentation, Mr. Blumenfield, for yeah. this? I think we can just move to the questions. Great. Go uh, ahead. Th thank you. No, yeah. and, and we have to look more closely at every expenditure for a roadmap program, which is funding 6,700 interim beds that we've built over the last two years, and the room key projects. Right now, we're funding our tiny homes, bridge homes, other homeless services through COVID emergency funds, state grants, county reimbursement per the roadmap agreement, and the 55 million of cities general fund found in the GCP additional homeless services. Next year, this is by way of background for the questions, uh, it's projected of the $20 million in GCP additional homelessness services, 9.5 million is already committed to continuing our interim housing operations and 2.1 million already committed for departmental staff. So we've spent, I want my colleagues to understand that, that we've already accounted for most of it. So a couple of questions, um, first, uh, and re with regard to the recommendations, on recommendation number 11, it says approve up to 75 million for the county, and we get 60 million a year from the county for the roadmap agreement. So is the 75 million reimbursement from the county for multiple years, or is the 75 million we're getting up front to fund operations for the next fiscal year? I guess 
Good afternoon, Mindy Patongson with the Office of the CAO. So we do receive the six million, um, but then we also re um, we're also counting the savings or the uncommitted funds for this fiscal year because we didn't commit all of it. So we're projecting about fifteen million dollars savings, and so we're programming that plus the six mi sixty million for next fiscal year. So it's all it's all for the the seventy five million we're getting is all for next year. It's not multi year. Ed Gibson, it's fifteen million. I'll just say, use the words, left over from right. this year, roll over plus, 15, six, plus, 60. plus the 60 move we get next year. Right, but that's 75, yeah. but we're looking to spend all of that this this next coming year. year. Correct. Okay, now that just was a little unclear to me. Um, recommendation two, it says reprogram 1.2 million in unspent funds. 2A lists there's 938,000 in unspent from the winter shelter program. And I wanted to understand a little better if we know why that was underspent. This past winter, there were limited winter shelter sites. There are explicit instructions for LASA to scope out additional winter shelter locations. So how do we avoid scrambling again next year and having an underspend on our winter shelters? Uh, so regarding the winter shelters, so at one point the winter shelters were counted towards the roadmap, um, and so it was an eligible use of the county fundings for that, for the roadmap. And so um, those beds were since taken off um, of the roadmap, and so Therefore, they're not an eligible use anymore. Um, we, I would have to report back on what's the reasoning on the underspend uh, from the of the 938,000. But um, to ensure that we're not um, meeting a shortage this fiscal year, we did provide loss of additional winter shelter funding this current fiscal year with CDBGCV and um, with GCP additional homeless services on top of the general fund that they already received. Uh, and so we, this for the mayor's proposed budget, this for next fiscal year, we did. Re um, program what was requested that um, for a LASA and so we'll we can continue working with LASA to make sure that you know like the they're receiving the necessary funding for to continue services and expand services um, utilizing any of uh, any other available funding sources okay but I'll certainly take you up on your offer to, to get back to us on the reasons why and how we can avoid that mm -hmm. this this coming year um, also, the roadmap expenses, I wanted to know what other roadmap expenses are we anticipating? And specifically, if we accept the 500 pallets that the state wants to provide to the city, are there going to be additional costs to the city? And if so, what funding sources will be available to use? Or are we anticipating that that money is going to be um, fund all of the related costs? Well, operationally, hi, sorry, Annabelle Gonzalez. Um, operationally, given that um, the roadmap agreement is ending in 2025, and a lot of the programs have actually been operational within the last two to three years. For some of the tiny homes and some of the abridged homes, um, there may be some maintenance required um, just for timing purposes. And then also, um, uh, there are some shortfalls that are occurring um, operationally. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, can you a ask the second so part of the question again? Well, we're getting the 500 homes. 500 pallet shelters from the state and there's some money that comes along with that and what I'm trying to get at is are there going to be is that going to be taking costs away are we going to have to spend more money to make that work or is everything contained within that money and we can expect that that sort of is self-contained so we will be funding operations for those 500 tiny homes um, and depending on location possibly leasing um, that is to be determined based off of the sites that are selected. Um, but anything in terms of um, construction um, and uh, permitting, anything of that sort, should be all encompassing within the 500 tiny homes from the state, including their, their funding. But we're, we're anticipating taking on the leasing costs? And for operations, the, For correct. the land and the operation costs. And where do we anticipate getting that funding? Um, we do currently have the roadmap agreement so that could be in addition to that program as well as the Alliance which is um, the Highland Gardens hotels currently under or okay. anticipating yeah, at some point I'd love to drill down and understand how those costs are going to work because uh, they could I mean it's great I'm, I'm not lo looking a gift horse in the mouth we want the 500 homes just want to have our eyes wide open and understand how that's going to impact all of our other priorities and and whatnot. Costs, and I also think um, the commitment under the Alliance settlement for the number of beds 
uh, and how that figures in with our inside safe commitments. I think we have to have, uh, we were just talking to uh, Mr. Gibson yesterday uh, about that and hoping that he'll come to this committee and lay that out for us. Roadmap commitments, alliance commitments, inside safe. Right. What are our dollars being spent there? Because this is, all, this is a, a great thing, but it's all outside or in addition to inside safe. Um, and it all is related, but that's 500 more units. Um, and then I mentioned the funding sources for our interim road, roadmap sites. Did I miss any? Are there any other pots of funds outside the city's general fund that we should be aware of? For specifically for the roadmap? Yeah. Um, we also have used, um, in our HAP report, we've programmed funding for Project Home Q 1.0, and that's operations that our beds are accounted against roadmap too. Okay. Um, last question, just the recommendation 17 related to the Project Room Key demo demobilization. Is this for the extension of the LA Grand or does it cover other room key costs? Um, this is not for the extension of the LA Grand, it's just for all the other PRK COVID related um, hotels that have um, late invoices coming in for damages. So we just want to make sure we are we're kind of reconciling it, everything and processing the final payments. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so clearly with the roadmaps, you're able to delineate. We know what we're leveraging from the county, right? Yeah. yeah. So we know. So I guess. You know, I guess for me, and this is not really a question, it's just more of a statement, that we already know the formula of how to report out what pieces of how we house people, where they matriculate in the process. Uh, we, we have that data with respect to the roadmaps process, right? Where we have placed individuals, we know what components the county is funding uh, in that process. We know what we've funded in terms of the uh, housing. So. Um, <clears throat> you know, it just, for me, it just kind of, for, it doesn't necessitate a response. It's just more, as I said, more of a statement uh, to just kind of, if we could provide that formula and just that example of how you manage to track that um, with respect to some of the additional efforts that have most recently been deployed, I think it would be beneficial for all of us so that we can show how we're managing, that we manage to track all of the same data points that we're looking at. Um, it, it's not... It's not rocket science. We know how to do this. Uh, and so I, I just, I, I would really, I think, so that we could be consistent in how we measure what we're doing, we've already developed that structure with this process um, and managed to effectively leverage resources from the county, from, you know, whatever federal, re like we've, we've done it. So um, I think if you could help provide that context and that, and that modeling, I think that would be really great for tracking all efforts uh, and applying it because it's a it's a measure that we have already developed and started executing uh, across the entire city. Uh, yeah, Thank we can do that and report back. There are some a little a couple of key differences that make it so we have more of the information at our our hand, and then we get uh, the reports from uh, Lassa, Lassa at times. So, but so my, but very but very specific stuff we have. you are you are correct there's there's right so there i mean it's it's not like we can't get this information from lasa we can uh we have uh we also know what we get from the county to support this effort we also know what the city puts in so it's uh i, I don't know that there needs to be an overhaul of a system uh we just need to get the data and plug it into the formulas in the same manner that you've already been tracking it with respect to the roadmaps yeah so great okay thank, thank you, you. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Point well taken. Um, unless there's ad additional questions, I think we can note and file this item. No. Uh, voting as amended, Madam Chair. Voting as amended. Yes, yeah, sorry. Vote on it as amended. So apologies. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Councilmember Lee is absent. Four ayes, and this item is approved as amended. Uh, and I think you can stay because next we're going to have item six. You want to read that item into the record? Item number six, our city administrative officer and Bureau of Engineering reports relative to the lease extension for continued use of the crisis and bridge housing at 2817 South Hope Street and California Environmental Quality Act exemption determinations that, consistent with the notice of exemption already in the city council's prior actions, council file number 18-0750, the project is statutorily exempt under public resources code 
section 21080B4 as a specific action necessary to prevent or mitigate an emergency as also reflected in CEQA guidelines section 15269C and under PRC section 21080.27 applicable to City of Los Angeles emergency homeless shelters and the Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Program Round 3 First Funding Report and Related Matters. That's the title of the item? Yes, it is, Madam Chair. Wow. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, if we could, I don't think we need a presentation unless, Mr. Bloomfield, you wanted one? No. Okay, let's move to questions. Go ahead. Okay, and I know you can go first. I have a couple, but go ahead. I have an amendment. Oh, you have an amendment? Yes. Yeah. To this item? Yes. Okay. Pranita Mate from CLA's office. Um, amend recommendation number 17 in the report to replace the current recommendation with the following. Approve 1,500,000 from HAP 3 fund number 65S slash 10, account number 10W744FC4 outreach, hygiene, prevention, and supportive services to the Office of the City Administrative Officer, yes. fund number 65S slash 10 in a new account entitled DHS Multidisciplinary Teams for Multidisciplinary Teams in CDs 589 for costs from July 1, 20, 2023 to June 30, 2024 to reflect an additional $150,000 for the CD8 NDT. Um, 17A, transfer 1.5 million from HAP3 fund number 65S slash 10 in the newly established account entitled DHS Multidisciplinary Teams to the Office of City Administrative Officer fund number 100 slash 10, account number 003040, contractual Great. services. Okay, great. And uh, I believe we have questions on this item. Oh, does someone need to second that? I'll second that amendment. I'll second. Okay. And let's move to questions. Okay, yeah, questions and actually some, some amendments too. That I, oh, goodness. That, uh, nothing too crazy. But uh, first, for recommendation number eight, which is to approve the 14 million from uh, HAP3 to LASA for time limited subsidies, how many time limited subsidies is this actually going to provide and how does time limited subsidies actually get distributed? Uh, so, this, we are estimating that it can provide up to support 672 households. Um, and in terms of the distribution, I think we would have to report back to you. I think it would be appropriate to have LASA here um, to provide that insight. Okay, that'd be great. I'd love to, to get that. Uh, second, for recommendation number 13, <clears throat> which approves the two million from HAP3 for USC Medicine Street Teams from July 1 to June 30, 2024, when council considers the budget committee's recommendation to allocate three million to the USC Street Medicine Program, I'd like to amend uh, to increase the, the HAP three contribution for USC Medicine from two million to three million. And the reason why right now we're projected to fund the Street Medicine Program two million from HAP and one million from GCP additional homeless services, in which it's projected the council will only have 3.5 million to cover all of our expenses. So basically what I'm proposing is a simple swap so that we have, since we're able to get this money from the HAP3, this will free up a million dollars in the GCP that the council is controlling. So it's not changing the overall amount. It's allowing uh, us to swap out a million so that we have more flexibility as a council. So that's... And where the, is it taking the million? It's, it's increasing the HAP3 contribution for USC Medicine, which is currently at two million, making that Three million in this, in this, uh, and then that would allow us to to then. We're spending a million right now of our very limited and overly spoken for GCP homeless money, uh, where we only out of that twenty million we only have three million left essentially, um, and it would give us another million that okay. we could ultimately program. I'm not programming the money. I'm just creating more flexible money for this council. By, sure. by using that. So, but that's to do that, we have to make that amendment here. So proposing that amendment. Chair, sure, I'll second that. Okay. Um, third, uh, related to recommendation 14, 
to instruct the general manager of LAHD to amend its contract with the USC for the expansion of street medicine June 30th to add the instruction for the CAO's office to assist LAHD with reporting metrics and lead the coordination of the city's street medicine and unarmed crisis response efforts. So that's just adding an instruction to be clear that we want street medicine and unarmed crisis response efforts. Okay, and then four, uh, item for recommendation 24, which is 741,000 in salaries of the mayor's office for a city homeless uh, initiative to reimburse the funding for one director of interim housing, one senior project manager, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm just noting the reimbursement for the mayor's homeless team. This is, is this money above and beyond the 7.8, uh, that we're at, at in the mayor's budget, or is it the result, is this money that's gonna go back into the general fund? So we're, we're adding these, in this recommendation, we're adding these positions. And in the budget, we, we, we granted the mayor's request for those positions and funding it out of the 250 million inside safe. So one of two things is gonna happen, either inside safe goes up by that amount or the general fund uh, gets goes up by that amount. So, sorry, this is, so this is separate from the 7.2 that's in the mayor's proposed budget. This is, these are existing fundings that we programmed in the current, like in previous fiscal years to continue funding for these um, existing positions. So um, the positions that are in the mayor's, on uh, the mayor's proposed budget is um, an expansion or like a, a new structure. So this is above and beyond the 7.8 that is in the mayor's budget, these positions, but it's the same positions. No, the, these are different. Are we looking at item 24? Yes. Those are, those are these positions are positions throughout um, well, it's in various departments, if you will, and other items that we fund for all the work inside the budget was a, a seven plus million, like seven plus million dollar number Staff, but that staff number was closer to 700 or so, a little under 700 or so thousand. Was it 700,000? Oh, those numbers, too many numbers. Last year. 640. Six, 640, thank you. My so, so this is above and beyond. So the mayor's staff gets the H, HAP staff and then the additional 7.8 million. Yes. So this is, um, it's, I wouldn't say it's in addition, I guess just to continue I, what they've already, that what they've already received. Okay. Just wanted to understand that. But, okay, great. So those additions that I, okay. last one was informational, uh, and then the, the first, the, those two were uh, amendments. Okay, great. So let's take a vote on this item. Oh, you have a question. Sorry. Yeah, Go real ahead. quick. So, uh, and I know we had the conversation, Mr. Blumenfield, during budget, and I've, I've been rather redundant in raising this issue, but we've got a lot of different funding sources for outreach. Uh, and, you know, you just, just you know, you, you reveal just another pot uh, again. And I believe we requested, if you could help remind me, did we request, I mean, I, I was very explicit about like, I want every pot and every outreach strategy that is being funded by the city, that is being, like, to be delineated in this process. And so, um, again, I just, I keep finding like every time we're having a conversation, it's like, oh, look at, here's another pot of a handful of people. Uh, and so all this outreach, and yet, you know, in some cases, no one's being spoken to. So, um, I, you know, I just think it just, you know, again, just another statement. I know the monologuer always gets killed. I'm just still a little ticked off about it. I look forward to getting that report back. I know we're expecting it from both the CAO and the CLA's office to uh, further delineate, uh, you know, who's on first on this. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, I'm just really frustrated by seeing the constant kind of duplication of outreach strategies that are happening and managed by independent entities, whether it's a council office, whether it's the mayor's office, whether it's LASA, whether it's a spa lead, okay. whether it's anyone who just decides that this is their volunteer uh, give back service. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a little much and um, there's just way too much money being thrown at it without any results. So. Um, 
just uh, just want to thank you for helping to pull that out because I missed that one. Yep. Great. And you did ask for a special study in yeah. the in the okay. budget, which we will be thank presumably great. Uh, approving tomorrow. Thank you. We look forward to getting that and getting to the bottom of this. So with uh, with that, let's vote on this item as amended. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Councilmember Lee is absent. Four ayes, and this item is approved as amended. Great. Thank you all from the CAO. Thank you all on this committee, as always, for your diligent and enthusiastic participation. And this meeting is adjourned.